So you do this kind of three week program where they unprocess their diet. Then you put them on this kind of 18 hour fast. So they're having two meals a day over six hours. And then for 18 hours, they're not consuming anything. Uh, we must talk about any contraindications like insulin or blood sugar medications at some point, just to make sure that, you know, people who are listening, who want to try stuff that we've we've covered that. But also, I want to go a bit further, because I know you have used 24 hour fasting with patients. I know you have used three day fasts. And you have also shared in previous conversations, some very powerful statistics. One in particular, I remember on a seven day fast, you shared a statistic, a bit of research from Boston, in terms of what that does to your lifetime cancer risk. So maybe you could talk about some of these longer fasts. And then practically, how do people start going about that? Yes, yes. So absolutely. So at all times, they are supposed to take the blood pressures twice a day, make sure that uh, the blood pressure is not going down to because they do not stop the blood pressure medications okay. right off okay. the bat. So on the blood pressure medication reduction will be done uh, depending on your blood pressure readings. As far as blood sugar is concerned, if they are on oral agents, I'll continue those oral agents while they're doing the 18-hour fast periods. Even the 24-hour fast, I'll keep them on it and I will ask them to monitor the blood sugars. Now, continuous glucose monitoring, the, 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 the little uh, devices, I only advise those on, on patients who are on insulin right, when I'm right. fasting them because I want to make sure that the insulins don't drop off. But when a patient is taking insulin and he does the 24-hour fasts, I drop the insulin levels by half first. I mean, insulin dosage by half, and I monitor the blood sugars. And then when they go beyond 24-hour fasts, I stop insulin completely, completely, yeah, completely. Yeah. I stop it completely because I don't want them to become hypoglycemic. So oral agents, I will continue. Insulin, I will discontinue if I'm doing more than 24 hours, but I monitor the blood sugars very closely. And then that brings me to a little longer fast. Before I go to uh, longer fast, I make them do a 36-hour fast. So I'll make them do that once a week. Once a week means that evening rolls around, skip that meal also, and then have yourself a breakfast. Treat yourself with a breakfast the next day. And that brings it to 36 hours. So I make them do at least one 36-hour fast for maybe you know two consecutive weeks and then I'll take them to higher levels. Can I just clarify? Can I, can I just clarify that? So, the thirty-six hour fast, the way you have found it most beneficial for most of your patients is what you skip one evening meal to the next evening meal. What, how, when when does that fasting time? I know you can do it any way you want, but what have you found to work? Can we just clarify that? Yeah. So the patients already are used to having only one meal a day. Okay. So okay. then I'll say skip that one meal. And then have the next meal when you're supposed to have them. That'll bring it to 36 hours. So for most patients these days, they're having their evening meals because it's more social. They're having it with okay, the families. Okay. So they'll skip breakfast. They'll skip lunch. Evening comes around. They're supposed to eat. And I tell them, skip it and go and have breakfast the next day. That brings them to 36 hours. I guess if they're already used to having one meal a day, then actually skipping that evening meal is kind of, I don't know, just go, yeah. to, go to bed early as well, you know, <laughs> sort of, you know, it's, yeah, I like that. So what stage do you take them from this two meal a day, which is this, uh, you know, the six hour eating window, you know, you you do that initially for the 18 hour fast, then you take them to 24 hours, do you with just one meal a day? Is that how you do it? That's exactly how I do it. And then they're doing one meal a day, five days a week. Hmm? Weekends, they're going to have two meals. <clears throat> they do that for two weeks. And then I say, okay, you've been doing this for two weeks now. You've been having only one meal a day. Next few weeks, one day a week, you're going to go to 36. And the way you're going to do it is you're going to skip that one meal also and then have a breakfast the next day. So that'll bring you to the, and I want to see how you feel. And most of them come back saying, I just missed the meal in the evening. I watched a movie and went to bed. So why am I going from 24 to 36 because I want to get them ready for longer fasts, especially if they're tremendously overweight and they're metabolically deranged. What's the biochemical advantage between 24 and 36? At By 36 hours, almost all of them will be in some degree of ketogenesis. So it's hard to know who's going to start spilling ketones at 18 hours, 
24 hours, 30 or 32 hours. It's hard to know that. So when I prime them, <clears throat> then I'm finding that there's longer and longer periods of ketogenesis. That means they go into ketone production at 16 hours. So long as they made their dietary changes, gradually got into this, the ketogenesis phase starts a little bit sooner at about 16 hours. And the most motivated patients say that, oh, I want to know. I said, okay, if you want to know, then go to the pharmacy and pick up some keto sticks and just test your urine and tell me when you started spilling the ketones. So after 24-hour fast, almost all of them are spilling ketones. And when they're spilling ketones, I know what's going on with their physiology at that point. I know that they're getting the benefits of some degree of autophagy, growth hormone, um, uh, BDNF production, and mitophagy. I know that's happening because they're, they're spilling ketones. So spilling ketones. So that's another motivating thing. In the patient who's showing me the interest and the ones I really want them to do, yes, give them the tool. Take this home. Check your ketones. That's what I find so fascinating. So by 36 hours, they're making the ketones. So they'll do that for a couple of weeks where they now went to 36-hour fasts once a week for two weeks. Now, at that point, depending on how motivated they feel and how well they are doing, now I'll go to more prolonged fasts. And my favorite fast is the three-day water fast. And uh, most of them, I'm telling you, greater than 95% of them when they've graduated to this point, where they've gradually gone and done all this, they're able to do the three-day water fast with no difficulty whatsoever. And if they get cramps, then I tell them, okay, take a glass of water and put a pinch of salt in it and just, just down it and you'll feel better. But most of them don't because they've adapted themselves. If you go into a three-day water fast too quickly, you're going to get more cramps. But more importantly, you're going to go through what is known as keto flu and you just feel terrible and achy and you just feel... Really bad. So I do it gradually. But I must make them go to a three-day water fast. I use it in that case. I also use it in patients who are able to lose weight, but then they reach a plateau. So now they're weighing 230 pounds, and I want them to have more weight loss. So they've been doing this now for a month, and they said, look, doc, I just can't shed any more weight now. I've done everything you're saying, and I'll put them on a three-day water fast. And lo and behold, they'll start losing weight again. So I use that in patients who've reached a plateau going to the three-day water fast. Thank you for sharing that. I think something I did want to bring up today um, because I know a lot of people, and again, we're, we're all influenced by the online world or the patients that we've seen or the online world that we inhabit. And, you know, I spoke to David Sinclair, uh, this Harvard professor who talks about aging in a very, very profound and novel way. And... You know, when I put out that episode with David, a lot of people were saying, look, asking people to skip meals uh, is very triggering for people with eating disorders. And I know eating disorders are on the rise uh, massively all over the world, certainly here in the UK and in, and in America. So I think we need to be careful about that. Uh, I think it's worth me uh, just flagging that here that potentially this advice is not for people with eating disorders. That's a sort of separate issue. Well, I'd welcome your perspective on that. Um, but also, you know, is it possible that we take these things to extremes? I guess there would be some people, we mentioned Anna Lemke's book before, Dopamine Nation, and um, that we're all, we're living in a world of addicts now. And that, you know, she mentions that the smartphone is the modern day hypodermic needle, which I thought was a very provocative way, but but I, I actually completely agree with her of talking about it. There's health, there's physical biochemical health, but there's also this kind of emotional health and our mental well-being. Do you think, as much as you love fasting, do you think some people, they can sort of overdo it and get so addicted to kind of that feeling of fasting and actually go to an extreme which potentially could become problematic? I think you're right. It can happen. Fortunately, I haven't seen it here with somebody. I tell them, stop now, stop, stop. This is enough. Now you yeah, should be yeah. eating two meals a day. And, you know, I think that the pattern you need to settle down in is for you, I think that two meals a day in a six or eight hour window period may be a nice thing for you to do chronically to maintain what you've gained, uh, the benefits that you've already gained. Um, then 
I haven't seen any patients who ignored that and continued to do the three-day right. water right. fasts on a, on a weekly basis or whatever, or two-weekly basis. I haven't seen that. But, but, but you are absolutely right that there are some patients who clearly have an eating disorder, and they clearly have a type of addiction, and they're going up at night, and they, and they, they creep downstairs, and they're eating away five bars of chocolates and all this kinds of stuff. And those patients clearly do need help, and I will yeah. not deal yeah. with those on my own. I will supervise yeah. Yeah. it, but I'll send them to a psychologist that actually specializes in addictions, because they have to really spend time with that patient about addiction behavior. And it's not just behavior about the food. There may be other issues that are actually triggering. Because um, you see, you, you slide from one addiction to the other, yeah. to the other, yeah. to the other. So, so you can't take off this alone on its own until you also take care, take care of the sugar and maybe the, the cell phone and, and other digital gadgets that give you the yeah, instant yeah. gratifications. And, and there may even be other issues. He may be a gambler for all you know, or have yeah, other yeah. type of uh, deviant behavior addictions. So no, you're absolutely right. So recognizing those with the biggest problems and addiction is a huge problem. And it's yeah. becoming more, more known now that... Uh, the addiction is to not only sugar, but it's also addicted uh, to, to to processed food content, yeah. processed yeah. foods, and the content of processed foods um, are very addictive. Yeah, for and sure, I think for that sure. that's why you want to change the the type of food that you. So you're getting rid of all the addictive substances in the food, the addictive sugar in the food, and then addictive behaviors in other aspects of your life as well. Yeah, yeah. So so it's it's, it's really looking at the whole thing. Uh, it's it's a, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. And yes, we we are an addicted nation. Yeah, um, yeah. We, 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 and that's why it's making it so easier for us to become addicted to food later on in life because it starts at a very young age. Yeah, yeah <laughs> We're no, already getting no. addicted to gadgets um, and instant gratification. I want to move on to the mental benefits shortly of fasting because I think there's a real... Uh, important piece there that we touched on a couple of times in the conversation already. Before I do, I sort of feel that that there's so much um, divisiveness and, um, you know, frankly, fighting about different diets that I think sometimes gets so unhelpful for the general public. Um, they see doctors who they admire saying this diet has got this evidence, this is really good. And they see another doctor who they admire, say this diet's really good, and it has all this evidence. And I think, and I know this from talking to patients and talking to the public, that many people find this incredibly confusing. I, I really like fasting for the right person in the right state of health. I kind of see it as the great unifier in many ways. Because as long as you are metabolically able to do that fast, you know, whether you choose to eat meat and fish or whether you choose to be vegan, if you are whole food primarily and not having uh, much processed food at all in your diet, then you're still going to get benefits from fasting, right? Whether you're low carb or whether you're vegan. And, you know, it's interesting that video that you did on fasting, Fasting for Survival on YouTube, which has, you know, had millions of views. I was reading through the comments just before this conversation, Dr. Jamadas, and the top comment was really, I think, encompasses everything that you stand for. He, I think said he was mostly plant-based and he started off following your advice with a whole food, mostly plant-based diet. I think he started off with 18 hour fasts. He moved up to 24 hour ones. I can't quite remember. Then he moved to maybe one three day one every six months. And he's documented his health journey over two years. And it is utterly remarkable that you put out a video on YouTube and you have completely empowered that guy to transform his life. So first of all, just I want to acknowledge you for that. That's just one of millions of people who've seen that video and changed their lives. And that's just incredible work that you're doing. But what do you think about this concept that fasting could be the great unifier? No matter what tribe you belong to, you can still get involved with fasting and yield and, 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 and reap many of those benefits. You're absolutely right. Um, the various dietary programs that have come out have confused the public. It's confused the physicians as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. my patients come in and say that I'm following this diet, that diet, and nothing happened, and this one's too hard for me, and, and and this one's too restrictive for me, and it doesn't fit with my lifestyle. I understand that. I understand that. Fasting forgives you. Fasting, in a sense, forgives you for certain 
foods that that you may then consume. And actually, think about it this way also. You eat that slice of bread after a fast, your insulin response is totally different in the fasting state than in a fed state. Mm -hmm. You're going to make less insulin for the same slice of bread in a fasting state. So it's... and. The, the 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 type of food that they consume. So when I first started out, I was years and years and years ago. I was, I would say, oh, you got to be a vegetarian. You got you got to drop all meats. And being in the United States, how many patients are going to become vegetarian, right? So, and then as the data came out and I started studying more and more, I changed. Yeah. I decided yeah. that hey, there's something wrong with this. You know, people should be able to eat ancestral foods and what they grew up with uh, uh, but the problem was processed foods then we take the foods and we process them we change them and all the additives that we put into and the way we grow our food or way we we we, we get our meats has changed so i said no 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 this is not right when i studied non vegetarian diets um, around the world how come they had this low incidence of heart disease? There are populations that eat only meat and only drink milk and, and blood, or, or the populations that only eat starches and a lot of it, and they also live long. Yeah, What's the yeah, commonality? Yeah. What was the commonality in all of them? The commonality was no processed foods, no additives, right? No, no sugar. So they, they, they all had simple diets. So then I came up with my own plan and I said, listen, you, you, what do you like to eat? What do you like to eat? So you want to eat red meat? Okay, then eat grass-finished meat because that will have yeah, more nutrients yeah. in it. The fats will be the right kind of fats. You will not have all those omega-6s in there. You, you, you'll have more natural fats in there. Yeah, and if you want to eat yeah. eggs, chicken, fish. So I let them do that. And I said, but you've got to also introduce plants in your diet because you need the plants, not for you. Yeah, and you're going to get some some water soluble uh, vitamins, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, into your system when you eat plants and all. But it's really for your gut bacteria. So you, again, I had to read a lot about the microbiome to understand that the fiber is hugely important, very important. Yeah. And, yeah. and and so I tell them, eat your vegetables as well. So this is my diet plan. Yeah. It's yeah. not so restricted. Just stay away from anything that your great great grandfather wouldn't eat, and no processed foods. Anything in a packet, box, barcode. Stay away from anything made into a flour. And that's been a hard one, the flour one. Yeah. Um, also in some It's everywhere. Asia, it's a huge, huge, huge problem. I, I love this. Um, you know, I'm so enjoying speaking to you. There's a real kind of, there's, there's just a beautiful energy. But there's also this kind of real life practicalness that you know what it's like when these patients come in and you've got in your head the ideal thing, but you've got to work with people and their tastes and their preferences and their culture and what they want. And I really do strongly feel that too many people these days on social media commentate, they look at the science and go, oh, this is what everyone needs to do. It's like, it's just not how it works in real life. In my experience, you know, people are different. They've got different desires. They've got different cultures, different preferences. So I really like that. You've mentioned all the kind of physical benefits, the biochemical benefits when we have a period of not taking in food, a period of fasting. But there's also something really powerful, isn't there? Like you have touched on several times about what it does for you when you know, oh, I can go 12 hours without food. I can go 18 hours. Wow. Oh, actually, I can go 24 hours and I don't actually need to put something in my mouth. I think we shouldn't undervalue just what that does for someone. You know, I think it's freedom. It's freedom from a dependency on food, addictive foods, processed food, sugar. It means that you can go about, you're out on the train station or the airport and there's no good food to have. Cool. Just don't eat. Take the flight. Don't eat. It, there's a real freedom, which many people feel that they are, ch they're in chains. I guess, to the food industry and to their, their hunger and their stomach. So, you know, can you speak a little bit about that and why you feel that's so important? Yeah, I, mean, I love the, the fact that you use that word freedom because, you know, I said, okay, it empowers the patient, but it is a real freedom. It's a freedom that, that they know that what their behavior resulted in no adverse effect. And that they were able to overcome this, which they never thought they could overcome. So these little hurdles that they're overcoming in their diet 
actually has huge repercussions in other aspects of their life. And really, honestly, it it percolates into their into their workplace, into their family life, um, in, in their social interactions uh, with their friends. Um, and I've seen that these people they just they just become more more uh, self confident. Um, and and I think it's because we introduce terms to them like that's who you are, the real you. So it opens up a new aspect of their existence that there is a part of me that's separate and apart from my body and from my mind and my cravings and my stomach and my feelings and, and all these things. And that's the real me. And of course, you know, th- th- this gets into some of that part that I have a huge interest in, which is who are you? Yeah, yeah. What, what, you know, who are you really? Um, where is the you? Uh, and why can't you, that, that you, change uh, your behavior? Of course you can, because you need to change your identification. So this is an identification change that I see the patients doing. Yeah, yeah. They realize that they are in charge, that, that, that them inside them, not the body, not the mind, there's actually an awareness, an amness, an I am. And that is huge, huge. And I found that people who have done this program over the last few years, they actually get work promotions. They actually become better supervisors. They become uh, just better family uh, members and, and, and caregivers. Um, and it's miraculous yeah, how yeah. one thing, because it's, it's showing them that, yes, you are in charge. Look, you can do it. You can do it. And they just self-empower themselves. It feels so good. Self-confidence just goes off the roof. And I think that that, 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 that there's a, you know, I'm learning more about this. Um, but, but, but I think it does boil down to, to, because that also brings me to stress management. Because one of the things we do tell our patients is that you, you, if you start getting stressed out during all this, these periods where you're getting into the fasting period, you need to go out and do some, some meditation. We tell them, and we show them how to meditate. And I have a very simple meditation technique where I just basically ask the patients to, okay, just uh, close your eyes and just concentrate on your breathing only. And when a thought comes, let the thought go. Don't follow up on it because then another thought will come in a few minutes. Don't follow up on it. Wait. Just come back to your breathing. Concentrate on your breathing as the breath goes in and out. And you will find that there will be gaps in between your thoughts that get longer and longer and longer. And my patients have all said, yes, you're absolutely right. There's blankness. I said, well, that blankness when you don't have a thought or when you're not thinking of something, that's you. That's yeah, the real yeah. you. And when you come out of this for 15, 20 minutes, you will realize that there is that you in you and you can make up your mind about anything. You can, you can do anything. It'll empower you yeah, and yeah. you'll feel less stressed out. You'll feel less compelled. You're less automatic. You will, be, you, you will become, as you said, that word that you used, you'll have freedom. You'll have yeah, freedom. Yeah. And I find oh, that fascinating. Wow. So you see that this whole thing, I, I said this in the beginning that you know, fasting seems to open up those, that onion into all different yeah, parts of yeah. your life you know it's just yeah, amazing yeah. stuff i mean i love it I, I just love it and um if and when we have our second conversation I, I could see us going deep into who we are spirituality and i i, I really do feel that's a missing piece in medicine like it's not just about telling someone what they should do for their health. I mean, people don't really do what other people say in the long term, in my experience. They, they well, might do initially to get them going, but at some point it has to change from being the doctor's plan to being my plan. At some point, it needs to be like they go on your three week unprocess your diet uh, sort of regime. They start fasting at some point, maybe after a month, two months, three months. You want that self-empowerment piece where it's like, yeah, okay, the dots guided me, but I know what I'm doing now. Right? I want to eat this way. I want to fast like this because I feel good when I do it. So I'm now doing it, not because he told me to, but because I want to. And I think that, you know, I, you know, I like you, I teach doctors. Uh, I, I always talk to them about this. This is a really important piece of the puzzle. Another thought I had is fasting is you know, initially at least a difficult thing for many people to do. And we kind of know that when humans do difficult things, 
whether it's fasting for 24 hours when you find it hard, or whether it's completing a half marathon when, you know, six months ago you couldn't walk around the block. What it does for us in terms of who we are and our self-esteem and our confidence, it's very, very powerful, isn't it? So I really love that you are bringing that up also in the context of fasting. We, we have to. You, you know that there's a huge in health, there's a huge component of your of your your your, your mental being and and your understanding of who you are and your role in in in, in your life and in, in the people around you. Um, so I have, one of my interests, and maybe we can talk about this on other occasions, is is you know what are your relationships like, especially with your mother, because that's going to tell you how long you're going to really live. It's amazing. Or you know when my patients are in the hospital, how many people come visit them after open heart surgery determines how quickly they're going to recover from open heart surgery. Same surgery. Whoa, 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 what's going on here? So we can, you know, there's huge repercussions yeah, yeah. on how patients' health is depending on their social. And then how do they view themselves in society and their role and, 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 and the hierarchy in society? And that seems to also dictate uh, outcomes in health, irrespective yeah, yeah. of how much health care uh, uh, facilities are available yeah, to them. Yeah. So uh, there's all these other social determinants of health that are extremely important. And I think that we don't talk about that yeah, enough. Yeah. And I think that that's something that we need to talk about because in cardiology, besides my fasting, my other aspect is, is, is I do want to get into all that with my patients to see that you know um, health is defined by... You, you basically metabolize your psychosocial being. You, you metabolize it into your body. So be careful about your thoughts, about who you are and how you're interacting with the world and everything that's going around you because in an instantaneous moment, you're actually metabolizing it into physiology in your body. Something I've been thinking a lot about, Matt, and I, I will put this to you in just a moment, is whether it's more important for people to focus on what to eliminate versus what to bring in. And of course, you know, that's quite black or white. Of course, they're both important. But certainly in the UK, there's been a tendency for people now to say, don't worry about exclusion. It's all about what we are including in our diet. And I understand it. I think people want to hear that message. I think it's a more palatable message. And I, I understand the rationale that if you are filling your plate and your diet with the things that you should be consuming more of, there's going to be less room for the things that we're trying to avoid or limit. I understand that. My bias is that I have been a clinician for over two decades. I've seen tens of thousands of patients. And I'll be completely honest, Matt, I have found more benefit in helping people cut out of their diets the problematic foods in the modern food environments, the, the modern food supply, than by actively focusing on what to bring in. It's not a popular opinion that you can put out there these days, but I underline this section in the introduction of Genius Foods, which I thought was really powerful. And again, this is these are your words, Matt. You'll see that actually slowing the aging process, including cognitive aging, is just as much about the foods you omit from your diet as those you choose to consume. So I've said quite a bit there. I'd love your perspective on that, Max. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's definitely, um, we have to lift the veil for people. This idea that all foods fit, right? That all foods are good foods, that there's no such thing as good or bad foods. I understand, like you, where that comes from. And certainly, people listening to this, watching this, are coming with a lifetime of uh, you know, of, of, of cultural attitudes about food preferences and, and the like. And I think that, you know, we have to, we have to be able to remove the morality from food yeah. and be able to talk about food in terms of its empirical value, right? Especially in a time where people are sick, right? Yeah. So context is everything. And we have to understand that we're talking to a population that is unwell. A study came out just a couple of years ago that found that about only 10% of people uh, are free of metabolic illness, meaning 90% of people in the US have some degree of metabolic illness. So this is a, a sick population. And I think that it's the responsibility of 
you know, the healthcare provider to, um, to consider context, right? Mm -hmm. And so this idea that all foods fit, indeed, that is the mantra of the junk food industry, because what that says is it's not our fault. It's not, you know, this sugar sweetened beverage that crams 30 teaspoons of sugar into a 16 ounce serving. That's the problem. It's your problem because you weren't able to moderate your consumption of these foods. Well, it's not innate to our biology to moderate our consumption of those kinds of foods, right? There is something wrong with drinking 50 grams of sugar, you know, in a beverage in one sitting. There's absolutely something wrong with that. There's not something wrong with you if you decide to indulge every now and then. That's a very human characteristic. It's a human universal, in fact. And I think that's where we have to be able yeah. to separate morality from this conversation about you know, what makes a food good or bad. To make sure you're taking action after watching this video, I have created a free breathing guide that's going to help you reduce stress, calm your mind and boost your energy. In this guide, I share with you six really simple breathing practices that work immediately. Even just one minute a day will start to make a big difference. To receive your free guide, all you have to do is click on the link in the description box below. I think that in an, an environment where 66% of people are either overweight or obese, and where we are trending toward a population where by the year 2030, one in two people are going to be not just overweight, but obese, right? We're talking about clinical obesity here. That obesogenic foods like sugar-sweetened beverages, like these hyperpalatable ultra-processed foods that drive you to overeat, which we've already established, right? Which we have good data now to say that these foods drive you to overconsume. That it's hard to argue that those that those foods are good, right? Yeah. You would argue that I think a, a strong case could be made that those foods are actually not that good, right? That they are counterproductive to good health. Yeah. And I would also argue that if you can't say that certain foods are bad, then we can't have double standards. You also shouldn't be able to say that certain foods are good. And so does that mean that we shouldn't say that like broccoli is good? Yeah. Does that mean that we should be censored when trying to say that like whole eggs are good? Whole eggs are great, right? We should be encouraging people to eat these foods. So I think we need to get back to a certain degree of, of logic and common yeah. sense and reason when it comes to talking about food. And again, I understand that everybody's different and some people have fractured relationships with yeah. food, right? Which is super important and we have to talk about that, but not every message is for every person. Yeah, uh, I so, think I, I completely agree with that, Max. And as you say, everyone's different. Everyone's got a different relationship with food. I think practically, if people have never ever done two or three weeks where they are literally only eating whole foods, right? The sort of foods that we're talking about, I think people will genuinely be surprised with how good they could feel. And that's why my approach as a clinician has always been, let's have a two, three week period where we cut everything out. Of course, you have to eat something in that. So it's not as if I'm starving people. They're eating real whole foods in that time. But the focus really is on what not to eat. And that what I find, like I mentioned with those migraine patients, is that people experience their life in a way that they haven't done before. They have more energy. They're sleeping better. Their skin feels clearer. Often, joint aches start to go. Like You see this so often and then... People can go, okay, right, this is getting a bit bland. What can I introduce? You know, and you bit by bit, they start expanding their diet again very intentionally to kind of figure out, ah, oh, you know, I'm not so great when I have that type of food. But, you know, that sort of education piece, when we're tuned in to how a certain food makes us feel, for me, that's the gold max because then it doesn't matter what I say or what you say, right? then they've become their own expert. Like they've used maybe me and you as their guides to help them get going. But ultimately it's like, yeah, I know Max has to eat that food or Rong says to eat that one. But when I eat that food, I get sinusy. I can't breathe mm -hmm. properly. I get itchy. And I think that individualized component is so important. I kind of feel that many people have really outsourced their expertise to other people. And, and I think there's value. And obviously, we're trying to help there. We're trying to help guide people with our podcasts and our books and our work. But I really feel that at some point, the reader, the listener has to go, no, 
okay, I've taken that on board, but now I'm going to be my own expert. I know what works for me. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to, yeah, the, 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 this notion of self-empowerment of, of agency and podcasts like yours, all the work that I'm putting out, uh, you know, my intent is that people use the advice that I give as a template to do their own research yeah. and to iterate and to tinker and to see what works for them. I mean, we could talk all day long about, for example, the benefits of kale. I happen to be a fan of kale, right? But not everybody is going to be a fan of kale. And kale is not going to digest well, for example, for some people, right? And so I'm not saying that you have to eat this food, right? But generally, when I'm talking about a, a, a food, an, a specific food, it's to represent really a food category. And for example, kale represents dark leafy greens for me, which I think is one of these foods that you would think would not be controversial, but of course today um, <laughs> is, right? <laughs> I posted about the value on my Instagram of dark leafy greens and how researchers out of Rush University found that people who right, who ingest on a daily basis about a cup and a half of dark leafy greens have brains that perform up to 11 years younger, right? So this, this really interesting insight, which is correlational to be clear, it wasn't, uh, that wasn't a determined via randomized control multicenter trial, right? But, you know, carnivores come out of the woodwork now, people who only eat meat and they're you know, and they and they have a problem now, a bone to pick with dark leafy greens. But dark leafy greens are, I think, a wonderful food. And for most people, it can be very well tolerated and provide a number of different important nutrients, some of which essential, some of which non-essential, but which we see as associated with with better health. And to me, should not should not be controversial. A very empowering, I think, um, idea that I have uh, put forth in Genius Foods is that people should ingest a fatty salad every day, just as a general rule of thumb. So a box that people can easily check off every day to consume uh, a fatty salad every day. So that, you know, were if this Rush University finding holds true that you could prevent brain aging, and in fact, reverse brain aging by up to 11 years, to me it should be non controversial. What do you mean when you say a fatty salad? So Many of the um, the phytonutrient, the phytochemicals in dark leafy greens are fat soluble, but greens don't contain a lot of fat. And so there was a, a very interesting study that looked at the absorption of uh, actually these carotenoids that we've talked about, lutein and zeaxanthin. And what the study found was that co-ingesting them, these two compounds, which are abundant in dark leafy greens, particularly kale and Swiss chard and spinach. There, these these uh, these greens are rich in in those two compounds. That if they are not co-ingested with a fat source, they essentially flow through you. Whereas consuming them with fat dramatically increases their bioavailability because they're fat soluble. So the fat generally that I recommend um, people using liberally in their salads is extra virgin olive oil, which increases the bioavailability. Basically, the way in which your body can um, the capacity for your body to access these very valuable um, phytochemicals. And so, um, yeah, so that's a, that's a, I think a great tip, but then there are all, there are other um, aspects to dark leafy greens that make them valuable as well. For example, arugula is the top source of nitrates, dietary nitrates, which we know helps support our body's nitric oxide pathway, which is important for maintaining healthy blood pressure. Yeah. Which again, we've established super important for good brain health. In fact, one high nitrate meal of, for example, arugula or beets, which are another um, very uh, food group rich in nitrates, can potentially boost cognitive function because it, it has the capacity to boost blood flow to the brain. And so you get that in dark leafy greens. You get um, compounds called flavonoids. There is a very interesting study. And carnivores, which is funny, I don't know how many gravitate to your work, Rungan, but I seem to be a, a magnet for... Um, people on all sorts of extreme diets, not least of which carnivore diets. Do you, do you have? I, I do, and I have some views on that. I wanted to, I wanted to talk about the carnivore diet with you at some point later on in this conversation. Yeah. So I do have experience um, <laughs> with it on, on on a variety of different levels. But but please continue. We'll definitely get there. Yeah. So there was a, a randomized control, actual, actual, actually multiple randomized control trials where they used compounds called flavonoids, which are abundant in dark leafy greens, another aspect of dark leafy greens that make them so valuable and, and add 
scientific plausibility to this, this finding, right, that regularly consuming dark leafy greens is associated with reduced brain aging. This randomized control trial, which is the kind of trial required to prove cause and effect, right? So that 11-year reduced brain aging was a correlational finding. But this randomized control trial used compounds called flavonoids, which are abundant in dark leafy greens. And flavonoids are quite literally plant defense compounds, which carnivores love to say are toxic for us, right? That, they, that these kinds of compounds should be avoided. But in fact, what this randomized control trial found was that it's these very compounds that have the capacity to boost BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, sort of thought to be like a miracle grow protein for the brain, supports neuroplasticity, supports the suppleness of, of, of your brain as you age, right? So they looked at levels of BDNF in serum and also cognitive function with cognitive, t cognitive tests, right? And what they found was that when compared to low flavonoid uh, foods, high flavonoid foods actually boost BDNF and support and enhance, in fact, cognitive mm -hmm. function. And so you find these food, these compounds, flavonoids, in coffee, in tea, in berries, in citrus, and in dark leafy greens, right? So again, these are uh, an, an, a food category that I refer to as genius foods, dark leafy greens. They also were um, surfaced in a study by Beal et al. 2021, I believe, as being one of the most nutrient-dense foods that we have um, access to because of the, the, the concentration of folate that you get in dark leafy greens. So not a food group to be, uh, to yeah. be avoided. You, you mentioned fatty salads, and, and, and I was flicking through Genius Kitchen today. This is uh, your cookbook, Matt, and... I'm going to find it now. There was a salad towards the end, which I thought, right, I'm making that this weekend. You may remember it had blackberries in. Um, I think it had avocado in it. The, the, the imagery was just absolutely beautiful. I thought I'm definitely making that. Do you remember the one? I think I think that would, that would definitely qualify as one of your fatty salads. I think it had in some of the genius foods we mentioned so far. Extra virgin olive oil, avocado, dark leafy greens. I think it had... Was it walnuts or almonds? Pecans, I believe. Yeah. I know, again, those are another one of your genius foods, right? The category yeah. of nuts that specifically, I think you mentioned almonds in the book, but would you broaden that out beyond almonds? Yeah, definitely. Nuts, I think, are great. They are, here's the thing, because nuts are um, rich in fat, but not just any fat, polyunsaturated fatty acids. They also contain, they're an abundant source of vitamin E. Wherever you find polyunsaturated fats in nature, you also find vitamin E. So this is actually another nuance that we didn't um, touch on in our discussion of these grain and seed oils, which I think is very important uh, to, to, to bring up. Wherever in nature you find polyunsaturated fats, you find a proportional um, amount of vitamin E because vitamin E in nature exists to protect polyunsaturated fatty acids. And in fact, the more polyunsaturated fatty acids you consume, your requirement for vitamin E actually increases because it's vitamin E that protects these fats in our bodies. Unfortunately, today we're consuming more polyunsaturated fats than ever before in human history, thanks to the preponderance of these grain and seed oils. But we tend to underconsume vitamin E. About 10% of people consume the uh, RDA for vitamin E, at least in, in the United States. But when you consume whole food sources of polyunsaturated fats, they're actually incredibly healthy, right? Like nuts are incredibly healthy. They're a rich source of polyunsaturated fats, but they're protected by uh, a, a commensurate proportion of vitamin E. So almonds, great source of vitamin E. Um, also magnesium, which is a macro mineral that about half the population doesn't consume adequate amounts of, which contributes to everything from ATP synthesis to DNA repair. Mm -hmm. DNA damage is at the root of one of the root causes of aging and possibly even um, tumorogenesis. And so magnesium is, inc is an incredibly important um, mineral. And you get uh, about 25% in just a handful of almonds. Every nut has its own sort of um, array of, of benefits. So if you don't like almonds, no big deal. I'm also a huge fan of pistachios. In fact, what gives pista pistachios their characteristic uh, color are carotenoids, lutein and zeaxanthin. Mm. Pistachios contain... Um, these carotenoids, which you won't find in any other nut. So if pistachios are your jam, go for it. 
Macadamia nuts are great, a uh, good source of monounsaturated fat. And we see time and time again that nut consumption is associated with reduced risk for neurodegenerative disease, for cardiovascular disease, for respiratory diseases, for yeah. kidney disease. So they're a great food group. Yeah, they really are. Of course, nuts are something that is easy for some of us to overconsume. I know I've been guilty of that before. You know, nuts are great for my brain. They're great for my health. And before you know it, like where did where did that pack of nuts go? So <laughs> I, I totally agree. They're a fantastic food to focus on. Again, like I mentioned right at the start, even some whole foods, some of us certainly can overeat. And certainly I particularly find I have to be quite careful with my intake of nuts. I can easily go uh, a bit crazy if there's a bag of nuts in the house, certainly for me. Yeah. So here's a good hack for that, because I, I completely agree that that nuts are very, they're among the most calorie dense um, whole foods that that exist. And I think it, they become particularly easy to overeat. Now, again, sort of a byproduct of modern industrial food is that you can now buy them without shells, right? And yeah. they come salted. Oftentimes they have added sugar. So just contributing to the hyper palatability of these nuts and making them ever so easy to to over consume. So actually my hack for nuts is I very seldom snack on them. I don't use them as a snack. I use them in, in, in uh, recipes mm. where they're portion controlled. So a lot of my recipes will integrate nuts, but they integrate them in a very deliberate and portion control way. And so to me, that's a great way to, um, to moderate my consumption of them. Also, you know, when you get them with flavored, as I mentioned, it just, you know, they become all the more easy to just yeah. like eat by the eat by the fistful. There's other kind of plant based genius foods in your book, of course, we, you know, mentioned a few of them, there's, I think, dark chocolate and broccoli and broccoli sprouts and blueberries and all kinds of things. But I want to move on to animal foods, because I think it's really important. You've, you've touched on the carnivore phenomenon, which is growing at the moment where people, well, many people are going to meat only or certainly meat heavy diets and are reporting huge health improvements from doing so, uh, certainly in the short term, at least, but but some to be fair in the, you know, certainly over three, four years. And as an open minded physician, I observe that. And because I think like you, Matt, I'm not wearing my dietary affiliation as my identity, I feel I'm able to observe and, and, and stand back a little bit and go, well, God, this is really interesting. Because I kind of feel, and maybe this speaks to why you can post about dark leafy greens and maybe someone from the carnival community can be quite vocal. I don't know because I don't know who that person was, but my theory at the moment is if you have struggled for years with your health, joint pain, skin problems, allergies, and you've been to doctors and you've tried to empower yourself, you've listened to podcasts, you've read books and you've tried everything and your life has been really, really negatively affected. And then you have stumbled across, for whatever reason, the carnivore diet, and you've gone on to it. And suddenly a lot of those complaints have vanished or certainly got a lot better. I get it. I get it that it's like, oh man, this is it. This is the elixir that I've been waiting for. And I get it. It's, it's like if someone goes suddenly vegan and they've never done it before and suddenly you know, if they're going from a standardized Western diet to a whole food vegan diet or plant-based diet and feeling better, we often, you know, we've all got biases as humans and we often feel, oh man, that's it. That's the magic diet. It worked for me. And, you know, certainly my clinical experience has taught me that there is no one diet that works for everyone. I've seen people following paleo diets thrive. I've seen people following vegan diets thrive. And, you know, I've come to the conclusion that the right diet for you kind of depends a little bit on your previous health, what your goals are, where you are at your life at the moment. It's like all these things factor in. And so like you, I have these frameworks and guidelines. But within that, I think people need to play around a bit and personalize them. So my view on the carnival diet is, I know we don't have any long-term data yet on it, you know, but I never want to um, 
I never want to make someone feel, you know, someone who's transformed their lives by changing their diet. I get it. Like I really understand. And, and again, my bias, Matt, says I've seen sick patients for over two decades. Mm. So when that person finds something that works for them, I get it. I get why they're potentially even resistant to hear anything else. It's like if I had pain my whole life and suddenly I went carnivore and it healed my pain, you know what? I don't think I'd listen to anyone. I'd be like, you guys say what you want to say. <laughs> but I know that this diet works for me. So that's just a little bit in my perspective. I don't know if any of that resonated with you. We'll be back to the conversation in just a moment. Now, many of us struggle to find time to eat all of these incredible whole foods. That's why I'm a big fan of good quality whole food supplements like this one that's been in my own life for over three years now. It contains over 75 whole food source ingredients, vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and can help us support our energy, focus, digestion, and our immune system. AG1 are giving my audience a fantastic offer, one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first order. You can see all details at drinkag1.com forward slash live more, or just click on the link below. And now back to the conversation. Oh, a hundred percent. I feel the the exact same way. A lot of people tend to be down on what they're not up on, right? So people that have that that bring to the field of nutrition their biases, you know, maybe they are um, they're on a vegan diet, but more so than their dietary uh, choices, they are there is a side of them that that is actually an activist for various aspects mm. of you know maybe it's animal rights or environment, you know, planetary health and the like. And so people tend to get very um, heated when confronted with facts that challenge their own their yeah. own biases, right? And I think that's a big problem because people, as you mentioned, are just out here trying to see what's going to work best for them and to cure, to heal them sometimes, or at least you know mitigate s symptoms with regard to some very pressing, I think, health health challenges today. Many people are suffering from, and so I think that it's um it's definitely something that we need to study more. I know that they are trying to do that research. Um, I think it's David Ludwig at Harvard, or I know Sean Baker is always on his like Instagram trying, who's a prominent, you know, carnivore personality trying to recruit people for his studies um, and the like. So I, I, I think, think that the research is, you know, probably going to be coming out because of the number of anecdotes that you're seeing on social media. But I think a lot of the people who are seeing the greatest improvement of symptoms, they're coming from, uh, they're coming from sick places, yeah. you know, they're, they're coming from places of, you know, having crippling uh, you know, gastrointestinal disorders, autoimmune conditions and the like. And I, I think there, there is some plausibility to the fact that when you cut out, you know, certain plant materials that can instigate what's called molecular mimicry in the body, um, to somebody who has a, a dysfunctional immune system or, a, an impaired gut microbiome, for example, gut dysbiosis, yeah. uh, that you're going to see a reprieve from, from these symptoms and, you know, meat, at the end of the day is a very nutrient dense food. So I'm, I've always considered myself, um, to some degree carnivore adjacent. Uh, I definitely like to promote the value of plant foods. I think, I think, I think it should be a, a yeah. almost like a 50, 50 mix. I think, you know, my message is one of balance. I think that we have to embrace plants, but we also have to em embrace animal products. And I think that, you know, that can sometimes be the hardest message the hardest line to toe is that that message of balance, right? Yeah. Because you offend both parties. Yeah, I agree. I think I think we're touching on something that's really important, Max. If we're going to truly cut through this and, and help people, I have real sympathy and, and respect for that individual who has found something that works for them. And if that's a carnivore diet, I get it. I understand that. But at the same time, that working for that person doesn't necessarily mean that the research you are sharing about leafy greens is invalid. Right. That, that's the kind of unlogical leap from that. It's like, okay, cool. For you, maybe at this moment in time, maybe you've got a damaged gut. Maybe you've got molecular mimicry. Maybe you've got leaky guts. Maybe at this moment in time, you cannot tolerate a lot of the plant foods that Max is recommending. But I mean, Look, you live in America, it's probably worse there than here in the UK, but it's reflective of everything, right? Whether it's food or politics, like this kind of nuanced position in the middle 
it almost doesn't exist anymore. You offend everyone when you take it. You almost have to <laughs> nail your colors. You either are hardcore vegan or hardcore carnivore because your approach, I really like it, Matt. It's very balanced. You know, I'm not going to out of the gates recommend a carnivore diet to one of my patients, right? It's not going to be my starting point. But just as with, let's say, a patient with irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, a lot of the dietary recommendations people make often don't work for them if they've got severe IBS. They have to be very careful initially, maybe reduce their FODMAPs with the help of a nutrition expert whilst they are healing their gut, dealing with their stress levels. And maybe in a few months down the line, they can start to introduce foods that they couldn't tolerate. You know, my own health journey, Matt's, you know, I can now bring in foods that seven, eight years ago I couldn't tolerate because I've, mm. you know, I've repaired everything. I've gone back to basics. I've healed. I've addressed all the areas of my lifestyle that you talk about, you know, in your second book, The Genius Life. So, yeah, I kind of, it, I don't, how do you find it as someone who is putting out nutrition information regularly with, with the aim to help people, you know, do you sometimes just sort of bang your head against your computer and want to throw your phone against the wall? I mean, how do you handle it? Oh man, lots of coffee and <laughs> it's uh no, it is it it can be um it's 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 grating and it can be tiring, but uh you know, my north star is I've I've never thankfully knock on wood had any major health problems of of note. Um, other than the the occasional migraine, which has been uh, an annoyance to say the least. But the reason why I got involved in this um, is because my mom was very sick for many years. She, at the age of 58, um, started to display the earliest symptoms of what would ultimately be diagnosed as a rare um, and progressive and curable form of dementia called Lewy body dementia, which is akin to having both Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease at the same time. And so she had that for eight years, um, and it was a, a real struggle. And when she was initially diagnosed, actually even prior to her diagnosis, when she was initially prescribed drugs for both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, I had a panic attack for the first time um, and only time in my life, Googling the drugs, right? Which is what any millennial with a data plan would do. They would just, you know, go to Dr. Google. And when I saw that that her condition would get worse and that the drugs had no disease modifying effect. They were mere biochemical band-aids. To me, that was like a turning point in my life, really, where I, I, I became obsessed. I was going to say I dedicated myself, but it wasn't even conscious. I just became obsessed with trying to learn everything I could about diet and lifestyle and how all of these different variables play a role in terms of our predisposition to developing conditions like dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, like Parkinson's disease, which we know even less about. But, um, but you know, I, like you, have seen, I, I'm not a medical doctor, so I haven't seen it from the standpoint of a, of a clinician, but I've seen real sickness, like real sickness that very few people um, have, you know, have the, have the ability to, to see. And in many ways, it was kind of a privilege because, you know, I wish I could give it all back and, and have my mom back in, in good health. But it really got me to see the world in a new way. And it, and it really cracked open my perspective on all of the different ways that we could be living better, mm -hmm. living more healthily. And, and, you know, I think it's an insight. It also helped me have empathy for people and, and, and people's struggles, right? Like not everybody has access to the same kind of food that I have access to. Not everybody has the same kind of, you know, whether it's, you know, nutritional wherewithal or, uh, food access or financial um, privilege, right? Like, so it, it, it has made me very conscious of the fact that everybody is coming to this topic from a different place, and to do my best um, to to spread a message that's going to do the most good for the most yeah. people. Later in 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 my mom's health trajectory, she actually developed um, pancreatic cancer, and she passed away about three years ago. And so. Yeah, I mean, what I've seen is just like, I, I don't even know. Sometimes when I think about what I experienced with my mom, I don't even know how I am maybe able to walk on two legs like after that experience. It was so incredibly traumatic, but um, but it's motivated me in a way that I've, I've never experienced with anything else in my life to uh, do what I can to help separate fact from fiction for, for yeah. people, to help dispel nutritional misinformation. And getting back to your question, 
to keep my eye on the prize, right? I have a, what psychologist Jordan Peterson has called a noble aim, and that's to help people. So when people come at me, whether it's carnivores or vegans attacking me and my work, it literally, it's like, you know, it's like rain on my windshield. Like it falls off mm -hmm. because, because I know that I'm motivated by helping people and that, yeah. that, 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 you know, my truth is something that um, is really motivated and will always be motivated by um, understanding what it was that happened to my mom and the desire that I have to prevent it from happening to myself, others that I care about, and ultimately the public at large. Running, you know, even within the medical profession, people will say that running is bad for your knees. I'd love Poppycock. you to expand. <laughs> Poppycock, okay. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, um, but um, uh, look, running injuries are, are common, right? I mean, when people do any exercise, they'll injure themselves. And running is a, it can be very repetitive, right? You know, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of steps with high forces. And yes, people do injure themselves. And yes, the knee is the most common site of injury. But we already talked about this, that I think running is a skill. And if you actually learn to run properly, uh, the, the, the forces and that we actually know from a biomechanical level, as well as even epidemiologically, that proper running form can decrease the rate of knee injury. But the, but the chestnut of the, all those injuries, of the myths, is the idea that running causes arthritis in the knee. We've actually done a lot of research on arthritis in my lab and the evolution of arthritis. It turns out, by the way, that your chances of getting arthritis for a given year in your age have doubled since World War II. Doubled, right? Mm -hmm. and that's clearly because not because genes for arthritis have swept through the population. It's because our, our lifestyle has changed. And we're trying to figure out what that's, what that's about. And it's not being... Not, not, not about being more physically active because people have become less physically active today. And it turns out that running is actually, health, actually healthy for your knees. It actually, it's good for cartilage uh, growth. Um, it actually keeps the cartilage healthy as you, get, as, you, as you age, physical activity does. So and there have been maybe 15 randomized control studies showing that runners do not have a higher incidence of knee arthritis. And yet I can't tell you how many physicians I've told, I spoke to who just assume that with no evidence, yeah. zilch. They just say it because... It's a, it's, a, it's a cultural bias, and then they have the authority of being a physician, but they're wrong. It's just, it's just flat out wrong, and it can be disproved. Um, and so the problem I is, can I say, one, of the, one yeah. of the problems is, there's a wider problem here, I think, which is we're so far removed from our evolutionary heritage or you know, evolutionary norms compared to these modern societal cultural norms that I think we've become very we're so risk averse when it comes to physical activity. You know, anytime we talk about it, we have to give disclaimers. We have to say, yes, be careful when you do that. Like every time I submit a book manuscript, the editors come out, you know, just make sure that people aren't going to get injured and do this. And, and I understand it because of course, no one wants to get injured, but we, we've made something that is fundamentally part of our, our human nature to move our bodies We've turned it into something that's quite removed from us. We have to be careful. We need to, you know, we need to keep our back like this. We need, and, and again, please, I'm not trying to say that those things don't have merit for some people. I just really feel very much like you said, we've commoditized it. We've made it feel like it's this thing that's separate from the rest of our lives. And I think that's really problematic. Well, another example is sleep. I mean, one of the things, I, so when I wrote this book, I thought if I'm going to do a natural history of physical activity, I'd better start with physical inactivity because after all, it's two sides of the same coin. And I've been very interested in sitting for a while and I've studied sitting for a while, but I didn't really know, I'd not really delved into the sleep literature. And I was astonished as I started looking at the sleep literature that this idea that you need eight hours is, is also just made up as far as I can tell. There's there's actually no empirical evidence for it. Um, I mean, some people do need eight hours, but it's, it's been oversimplified and over-commodified and, 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 and imbued with kind of cultural significance. So when, it turns out when we look at people in parts of the world who don't have electricity, they don't have internet, they don't have iPhones, they don't have you know, telephones, they don't have anything that has electricity, right? They don't sleep eight hours. They actually sleep between 5.9 and 7.1 hours. I think that's the, I can't remember the exact numbers, right? Um, and, um, uh, and furthermore, when you look at epidemiological studies of very large samples of people, the op, you know, in terms of relative risk of heart disease and various other, other, other you know, illnesses, the optimum always comes out to seven, not eight. I mean, of course, there are some people out there because there's variation around the mean who do benefit from eight, but there's some people who get by at six. But somehow we've, we've turned eight into this kind of 
this, this ideal. And then what happens is that people feel like, oh my gosh, I'm not getting eight hours of sleep. There's something wrong with me. Then they get anxious. And of course, when you get anxious, you, you produce cortisol, which makes you stressed. And cortisol is the enemy of sleep. And we create this we create this kind of feedback loop, which then gets people to go buy drugs to make them sleep or spend ridiculous amounts of money on some, you know, clip on their nose that helps them sleep or, you know, whatever it is, you know, curtains or new mattress or whatever. And, you know, none of that, you know, we've created a sleep industrial complex based on a, on a cultural norm that's kind of Western and modern, but not necessarily rooted in our biology. Yeah. And I, and I guess, it's one of the problems really one of your central arguments is that it's there's no one size fits all right we're all different we all have to find what works for us what's going to get us moving i guess what's going to get us sleeping and some of us i guess you know i would just add from a from a clinician perspective that i I found that you can't really make these hard and fast rules for people because the individual in front of me there are so many other inputs going on into their life. So what are their stress levels like? What has been their state of health for five years? What, what else is going on? And therefore their sleep requirement is gonna depend on all those things. Whereas some of these communities, let's say without electricity, without iPhones, um, maybe, uh, I'm just hypothesizing here, maybe their stress levels are really, really low. Maybe they're actually, maybe they can get by with less sleep than someone who has huge amounts of stress. I, you know, I, obviously I, I can't say the answer to that. I'm just hypothesizing that it is quite individual, right? And, um, of course, of course. And, yeah. and, and we sort of miss that. So yeah. sleep, there's a myth there. Running is uh, good for the knees. Of course, if someone, so, so I'm just, just trying to play devil's advocate. Someone listening to that goes, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, Professor Lieberman, but every time I run, I get knee pain. So what should I do then? Well, I mean, um, well, there's two possibilities. One is you should back off because pain is an is a, is a adaptation. It tells you something's wrong, right? And, and you shouldn't ignore pain. And if, and if you have pain, you have to either, you can either treat the cause or you can treat the symptom. So the question is what's causing that pain? And one possibility is you do already have damage in your knee, in which case running will exacerbate it, right? If you already have arthritis in your knee, running is not a good idea because it's going gonna, it's gonna to exacerbate it. But the other possibility is that the way in which you're running is causing you to get the knee pain in the first place. And, and maybe you should, instead of, and you know, so many people go to a sports medicine doctor, right, who will look at their knee, but never look at how they run. Yeah. Right? They're treating the symptom rather than the cause. Now, you know, these are things, there's no one answer to it. And it's, I'm not saying that, you know, barefoot running is going to solve everybody's running problems. Um, but, uh, but you might want to look at how you run. And it might be that there's a better way for you to run that might actually alleviate um, the repetitive stresses that you're putting on the tissues around your knee that might be causing the running pain. But you know, it's a, there's no one size fits, fits all answer. Yeah. It's, it is a skill. And I think maybe I'd be interested to see what happens with kids. Like my kids have never really worn cushioned shoes, like from a young age, particularly my daughter, they've gone straight to minimalist shoes. So I don't know if you would make a, of course, they're not necessarily learning the skill of running, but they're also not, wearing cushioned shoes to start them changing their gait accordingly. So I don't know, have you got any research as to what might happen to those kids who've never worn cushioned shoes in the first place? Well, we've been studying that in Africa for ages, right? So we've, we've got lots of data. We've published many, many papers on, on kids who've grown up never wearing shoes and comparing them to kids from the same tribe who do wear shoes. And what we've not done, and what's really hard to do, is a randomized control study where you, where you randomize people into wearing shoes and not wearing shoes. As you can imagine, that's a <laughs> challenging study to do, especially in a place like Boston where it gets very cold winters. Um, but, um, but yeah, we've, you know, my lab, we've published lots of papers. Like we have a paper coming out, I think, today in, in, uh, in uh, Nature Scientific Reviews on, on, uh, on toe springs, that cur- upward curvature in almost every shoe that exists on the planet, including many minimal shoes, and how that changes the biomechanics of the foot. So we're, we're very interested in how shoes affect foot function and then how that affects how we walk and how we run. We had a paper last year in Nature which showed um, that about how calluses work, um, how calluses protect the foot, but, but how they uh, transmit all the, 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 the sensory information from the ground to the body. So unlike a shoe, which is a trade-off between protection and, and sensory information, calluses don't have that trade-off, which is really interesting. But, uh, so yeah, this is a, a subject of, 
of, of intense research in my lab. We, so so, so we, removing calluses, uh, as is a modern trend to do for cosmetic reasons, could be problematic. You're saying that calluses well, actually give us that sensory information that we need. Yeah, well, calluses also come from just, you know, calluses come from being barefoot, right? When the, the friction and the pressure of being barefoot, you grow calluses, right? And so most of us who wear shoes have very thin calluses, but people who are barefoot have thick calluses. And it turns out that thick calluses, I, I learned this when, when being barefoot, which is that, you know, I would step on something and I'd still feel it just as well, you know, as, as after my calluses had grown than when I, you know, because every winter, of course, I'm wearing shoes and then I often take my shoes off in the spring after the Boston Marathon and I sort of slowly regrow my calluses. And I noticed that as the, as the spring and the summer went on, I would step on the same pebble or a similar pebble and I would feel the pebble just as much, but it didn't hurt. So it wasn't that I was losing sensor information, I was just getting more protection. And so we, we that started a project to kind of, to study how calluses work. Because after all, you know, until recently, everybody, that was their, we didn't have shoes, we just had calluses. And, and my dog, you know, she goes barefoot all the time. Um, I, one of my favorite moments was, uh, I was running barefoot uh, a few, few blocks from my house. There's a woman I see all, every morning, you know, or many mornings, walking her two, just two beautiful dogs. And I remember one morning I was running by her on my way to the river here. And she said, you're, you're barefoot. And, and I said to her as I whizzed by, your dogs are barefoot. <laughs> and the look of shock on her face, like, oh my gosh, my dogs are barefoot. But you know, the dogs don't mind, right? And our, our ancestors didn't mind. Uh, people in all over the world don't mind. I'm not saying that shoes are bad or whatever, we shouldn't wear shoes, but you know, shoes change how, how our bodies work. And, 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 and there's nothing you know, judgmental about it, nothing wrong with wearing shoes. There's nothing virtuous about being barefoot. Um, but we, you know, we learn something about how biology works by, by studying people unlike us. Yeah, super, super interesting. A couple more myths I'd just like to go through before we wrap up, Daniel. Um, you mentioned earlier on in our conversation that hunter-gatherers sit down for long periods of time. So <laughs> there's, there's this idea that sitting is really bad for us. Um, what would you say to that? Well, I mean, you know, we, we again, oversimplify things, right? So you and I are sitting um, while we're having this conversation and uh, sitting is the new smoking. So we might as well just be smoking a pack of cigarettes, right? And it is true that people who are physically inactive do, do run into trouble, but, um, but it turns out that sitting is a completely natural thing. And again, we pathologize something that's natural. Um, so recent studies have shown, um, there's a guy named Dave Reichlin and uh, who, we did a study of the Hadza hunter-gatherers in Tanzania, and they sit almost 10 hours a day, which is basically the same amount as, as Brits and you know, Americans sit. Uh, so sitting isn't something weird and abnormal, it, but, but, but that said, um, how we sit is a little bit different. Yeah, so, I was gonna ask so, about that, how do so, they sit? So there's two important differences. The first is that many of us sit in chairs with backs. So like I have this nice back in my chair. And when I sit with that, that rest seat back, that's a very modern thing. I no longer have to use any muscles to, to kind of keep my, my back upright. And that leads to a weak back, which we think has, has related to lower back pain. The other thing is that uh, people in non-Western societies, uh, and, and some people in Western societies have a lot of interrupted sitting. They just don't sit inertly for hours and hours and hours. So, uh, and it turns out that getting up every once in a while, every few minutes, every 12 minutes or 15 minutes or 10 minutes, whatever, it depends on the study, has all kinds of metabolic benefits. It's like turning on the car engine, right? It, it turns on all kinds of cellular machinery. It lowers blood sugar levels. It lowers you know, triglyceride levels in your blood. It decreases inflammation. So you might sit the same number of hours as, as, as the next guy, but if you get, get up every once in a while, just move a little bit, that has all kinds of metabolic benefits. And then finally, maybe most importantly, it's what you do when you're not at work, right? If I sit all day at work because I have a nine to five job and then I go home and then I sit in front of the TV, I'm in trouble, right? But if I sit all day at work, but I go to the gym in the morning and you know, go for a walk and you know, do, some, do some exercise, et cetera, it's not the same thing. And it turns out that when people do epidemiological studies of sitting time against illness, it turns out that leisure time physical inactivity is far more predictive of health than work time. And so we don't often make these distinctions. So, so sitting isn't in and itself abnormal or dangerous or bad. It's how sitting fits into our overall life and how we sit 
um, that is important. I, I think that that's such a great distinction, and how we sit is 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 fascinating to me because. Um, you know, sitting in these chairs, or I guess what we're saying is the more comfortable our chair is, in some ways, the more problematic because we can have hours without actually activating muscles. We can just sort of, we can just sort of morph into the chair and not do anything. Whereas I'm guessing the hunter gatherers don't have an alarm or a smartphone telling them to get up every 12 <laughs> to 15 minutes. So I'm guessing they're sitting in a way that I wouldn't say it's uncomfortable. Well, how do they sit? Why don't you, why don't you explain how it well, is Well, so they're half, the time they, half the time they sit on the ground with their legs out. Maybe 15% of the time they squat, you know, another 15% of the time they kneel. You know, but, but they're always, you know, there's children running around, there's food on the fire, there's, you know, they get up every once in a while, but they're not sitting there glued to their Zoom screen because yeah. they're, they're locked down in a pandemic or they're not watching a, you know, a, a two hour movie or whatever. They're, they're kind of getting up all the time. And, and, yeah. and we know both epidemiologically, but we also know in terms of the, the, the mechanistic biology that you know, interrupted sitting is just way more healthy than, than uninterrupted sitting. And, 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 and while there's nothing wrong with sitting per se, if that's all you do, then yes, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna increase your chances of, of a wide range of diseases. Yeah, and I'll just admit one of my own personal bugbears is kind of societal norm, which is to tell children to keep their bums on their seat and not move around. It's something that- Oh, that's, it, that's so it, wrong. It, of course- it's good for you. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's like you're being a good, obedient child if you sit there and don't move, which is just completely, uh, you know, it's so far removed from our innate- uh, uh, needs and wants, you know, but I watch my kids, they want to move around. My, my son actually in his old school, he used to get told off because halfway in the lesson or 10 minutes in, he'd like, he'd want to squat on his chair. He just felt very natural and comfortable in that position. And he's like, bum on chair, stay still. And I'm like, and I was really conflicted because I'm like, I really thought, but well, that is, I don't want my son having to have his bum on his seat and, and stuck there for 40 minutes. Um, but it's, I think this is where your book, I think, is going to be incredibly helpful for society at large and just really busting a lot of these myths, having a bit more nuance in the conversation around physical activity and movements, which I think is very much needed. Uh, I, I, think it's, I, th I think it's such a fabulous deep dive into a topic that frankly affects all of us. I love the bit about grandparents in the book. Thank um, you. And I, That's my favorite section. It was such a wonderful bit to read about. And... I wonder if you could just sort of expand on it and why it's so important for us to remember, because many people, I think, as they get older, think that they should actually become less active. And you're sort yeah. of saying that may not be the case. Yeah, this is something we're working on further right now. But I, to me, I think it's maybe the most important part of the book in a way, which is that you know, we have this idea that as you get older, you know, it's time to kick up your heels and, you know, move to Florida or whatever it is, right? And just kind of be less active and take it easy and, you know, enjoy the enjoy your retirement, but you know, humans are unusual species. We evolved, we're one of the few species that evolved to live after we reproduce. We evolved to be grandparents. And we didn't evolve just to be grandparents, you know, to enjoy our grandchildren. We evolved to be grandparents to help our grandchildren. So if you look in the hunter-gatherer societies and in farming societies, grandparents are out there foraging and hunting and gathering and digging and doing all kinds of stuff and, and helping out their children and their grandchildren, providing food surplus, you know, helping, you know, being active. And in fact, we have data showing that people tend to be, often are more active when they're grandparents than when they're parents because they don't have kids in tow, right? And, and what's important about that, it's kind of like a chicken and egg question, you know, which came first, living long in order to be active or being active in order to live long. And, you know, they're, they're, they're both there, right? And, and it turns out that that physical activity is really important in, in slowing processes of aging and, and decreasing disease. Because when you're physically active, you turn on all kinds of repair and maintenance mechanisms, right? So when you're, when you're active, you, you, know, you, you stress your body, you produce reactive oxygen species, you, you, know, you, 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 get, you generate heat, you, do all, you turn up your, your sympathetic nervous system, your fight and flight nervous system, but then you spend energy after you're exercising to, 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 re, to deal with all that, right? We produce antioxidants. We produce molecules to fix all the proteins that we damaged because they got you know, affected by heat. We, we, we lower our blood temperature. We, 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 we turn on our parasympathetic, you know, rest and digest system to lower sympathetic activity. We turn on all these mechanisms that keep our bodies repaired and, and, and maintained. 
And the trick is that we ne because we never evolved not to be physically active, we never evolved to turn on these mechanisms in the absence of physical activity. We need that stress to mount the anti-stress response. And so physical activity, this is really at the heart of the book. This is why physical activity is so good for us. It, it turns on all kinds of good processes in our body that, that keep us from aging and keep us from getting sick. And so as we get older, that becomes even more important, right? You wanna keep your muscles healthy. You wanna keep your chromosomes healthy. You wanna keep your, your cells from deteriorating. You wanna keep the mitochondrial numbers up in your muscles. Uh, the, the list goes on and on and on. And that's why physical activity is so important. So as we get older, it, it becomes even more important to stay physically active because that, and, and of course the data are there. We know the epidemiological data, we know the mechanistic data, but we don't have this sort of cultural idea that, 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 that as we age, that's the time to keep up the activity, not turn it down. Yeah, it's really fascinating how we've evolved to be grandparents. I really like that as an idea. Um, you, you've, you've also mentioned in the book that we've not evolved to be too strong. And I found that really interesting. Yeah. Um, and it, it made me think of something, but I guess I've been pondering for a while as with this, with this sort of narrative around exercise and, you know, as a guy, you know, seeing since I was 13 or 14, seeing men's health on the magazine, wherever I went with a, with a ripped guy on the cover, showing off his six pack and his pecs and being quite influenced by that, I think as a, as a, you know, as an insecure teenager growing up, um, you now see there's, there's some, you go into gyms and you see some, you know, really, really muscly people um, who, who love bodybuilding. And I, I've actually had a few patients, including one, when I made a BBC documentary, um, this chap who actually had body dysmorphia and he had a real negative self-esteem issues, how he viewed himself and, you know, working out, putting on muscle was, was absolutely linked to that. And I just want to, before you answer this, I just want to draw a contrast. A couple of summers ago, I was in a place called Chamonix in France, which is at the foot of Mont Blanc. Uh, beautiful place. Uh, beautiful place. Uh, I was there in the summer with my family. I've got a lot of friends there. And one day we went to the swimming pool, the outdoor swimming pool. And what was really interesting to me is that if you looked around in the pool, it, it was so noticeable to me that the physique of people in the pool, whether they were, you know, you know, above the age of 60, 70, you know, in the middle age, young, the physique of people was just a little bit different. They're what you never saw, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people look really fit, but not in a like, a really, I've worked on my fitness way. So these typically would be people who live in the mountains. So they're getting around, they, they hike at the weekends, they might go cycling, uh, they make lug stuff up and down the mountains. It was almost like a functional fitness. They weren't working on being fit, yet they were actually really fit. And, and I think in some ways that actually supports everything you're making the case for in the book. So just a few thoughts there, I wonder if you could unpack them for me. Well, I mean, it, to me, for me, the big surprise is, you know, going to a gym and realizing, I mean, I have a tiny little gym in my basement, and I've actually gone, I've bought weights whose sole function is to be lifted. <laughs> if you think about it, it's kind of a really weird thing, right? Try to explain that to your great, great, great grandparents, that you'd go out and spend hard-earned money on something whose sole job is to be lifted. Like, why not just do some sit-ups or pull-ups or, you know, go out and do something in the garden, right? It's a, it's a very modern thing, right? And, and again, there's nothing wrong with it. I've done it myself. But, but, um, but we had this idea that, you know, of being ripped and buffed. And a lot of this happened, uh, I, in the book, I went into the history of this kind of modern, uh, of, you know, physical culture. A lot of it started in the Industrial Revolution as the machines were placing humans. And, and, um, and, and people were insecure and, and, um, and I think that led to Charles Atlas and this kind of rise of this physical culture movement, this idea of being really ripped and buffed and, you know, you know, uh, Mr. Universe kind of stuff. And, and we have this idea that, you know, to be, and there's nothing wrong with being really strong. I mean, you know, there's just for, for many folks, it's fun and some people really enjoy it, but it's, it's a modern thing, right? And, and, and our ancestors not only didn't do that, but they couldn't afford to do that because Muscle is a really expensive tissue. If you add a lot of muscle mass, you have to eat a lot more too. And in a, in a world in which, 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 uh, which, where food is scarce, you can't afford to to um, um, to have that kind of extra muscle mass. Furthermore, you don't have nautiluses and other machines that apply, you know, constant 
loads, no matter what the angle of your biceps are, etc. There is no way to kind of get that fit in, in a normal world. Uh, so, so again, uh, it's important to stay strong as you get old, uh, particularly to avoid muscle wasting, sarcopenia, which is a really serious disease of aging. Uh, you know, have, people have a hard time getting out of chairs and stuff like that because they lose strength. But we don't need to be super strong to be healthy. Um, and our ancestors weren't super strong. So if you want to go to the gym and get ripped, fine. That's perfectly okay. And, um, um, or if you enjoy you know, looking at people whose physiques are ripped, that's fine too. But let's not pretend that this is a kind of a, a necessary natural thing. And, I, and the other thing I think is that I, I worry about sometimes is people, people get really into what they do, right? They're aerobic people who do cardio who hate doing weights and people who do weights who hate doing cardio. And then they kind of self-justify what they do, right? Yeah. And the answer, of course, is that we, we have all to do a mixture of, of those things. Car cardio still is the bedrock of most fitness programs. You know, as a physician, I'm sure you know this better than most. But if you really were to do one thing to kind of work on your physical, your, your health, Cardio is probably it, but you should also add some, some weights in there too. I mean, that's also important. And some kind of mixture is, is, is you know, is what, is what we evolved to do and it's probably right. And if you want to do more of one, more of the other, that's fine. But let's not pretend that's what we evolved to do. We didn't evolve to be like super jacked, you know, caveman, you know, Charles Atlas's any more than we evolved to be, you know, Elliot Kipchoge's. We evolved to be something in the middle. Yeah. And, and, and I love your approach, um, Dan. It's very... So respectful of people's autonomy, their, their, their right to choose. It's like, look, you do it. Look, I'm going to present you the science. I'm going to present you the evolutionary story here. Yeah, if you want to do something different, go for it. But let's not pretend it's anything other than that's your desire. That's your passion. I think that's, that's a lovely way to approach it. As we sort of close this conversation off, I do think we should briefly touch on the immune system. Oh, yeah. Uh, because especially in view of what's been going on in the world. A lot of people are thinking about their immune system. How does physical activity play a role in the immune system? Yeah, well, um, uh, as I was actually doing the, the edits on the book, uh, you know, the lockdown had started and I, and I, and I, and I, I made sure that there was a, a section on respiratory tract infections. But, but the immune system is, like every system of the body, is affected by physical activity. And for the most part, just like everything else, it's, it's improved by physical activity. And, and we don't know exactly why, but I think it's because if you're, if you're in camp and doing nothing, you don't, and you don't leave, you don't encounter new pathogens, right? So I think there's a link between physical activity and immune function because as you, being physical, physically active was, a, was the way in which we, 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 you know, we left camp and, and, and got exposed to pathogens. That might be a hypothesis. Uh, and it's also part of this sort of repair and maintenance mechanism. But well, there's plenty of data which shows that physical activity, moderate levels of physical activity, upregulate key components of the immune system. So for, for respiratory tract infections, for example, when you're physically active, you not only produce more immune cells, like there's natural killer cells, which I love the name, right? You know, yeah. They're, they're naturally killing things in your body. They're, they're your, they kill, for example, cells that get infected with viruses, right? Cytotoxic T cells, again, an important part of your immune system, upregulated by physical activity. And not only are you produce more of them, but there's compelling evidence that you redeploy them to vulnerable parts of your body. So when you, when you go for a run, not only do you produce more of these cells, but you send them to the, the linings of your respiratory tract, which is, guess what? Where we get, we're vulnerable to COVID, right? To this, to this SARS a coronavirus. In addition, uh, physical activity upregulates the humoral immune system, the antibody production. As people get older, their antibody production uh, declines, but people who are more physically active have much healthier responses to vaccines and produce more antibodies. And again, for the same reason. And so, uh, so by being physically inactive, we increase our vulnerability to directly increase our vulnerability to respiratory tract infections. But physical activity also has in a, indirect effects by making us more likely to be obese, to have metabolic syndrome, to have all the hypertensive, which are all the covariates that increase your risk to disease. So if we're going to fight this, 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 this pandemic, one of the key ways to keep ourselves healthy is to stay physically active. Um, that said, there's interesting evidence and there's a big debate about whether too much activity yeah. makes, opens a window and makes you vulnerable. And there's, to be honest, there's not a lot of data because there's so few people who do too much that <laughs> we just don't have a lot of data at that end of the curve. Um, 
And it's still very debated. So within humans, there's not a lot of really good data, but in animal models, there certainly is. So there's, I, I cite in the book a study that is really quite an extraordinary study. They, they gave mice a really virulent form of influenza. And then for the few days where the, while the mice were coping with that influenza, you know, before the symptoms emerged, while their immune system was initially uh, dealing with it, some of the mice were, were sedentary. Some of the mice, they had them exercise like 20 minutes a day. And some of those poor little mice, they had them exercise like two hours a day. And the ones who exercised moderately had less than half the, the mortality rate of the sedentary mice. But the ones who exercised ridiculous amounts had much higher mortality rates than the sedentary yeah. mice. And to me, I think that, that highlights, I think, what every physician knows, which is that you know, some is good, but be careful. Don't overdo it because you're going to deplete your body of energy. And that, then if there's less energy, than your, which in your immune system takes a lot of energy, you, you, you could potentially harm yourself. So, so, so really, as we deal with the physical problems, the me- physical health, the mental health of this, this, this pandemic, but also just our, 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 our immune health, you know, yeah. staying physically active is just absolutely crucial right now. Yeah, thank you. That's a, was a really nice summary of, of the research there and, and sort of how it helps. Daniel, look, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for writing such a wonderful book. Um, I'll always like to finish off conversations with some practical tips for people. So the, the, the podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we're going to get more out of life. And I'm sure you know, when we move more, when we move in a way that makes us feel good, that, that allows us to move regularly, we're going to probably live longer and we're going to feel better in ourselves. So do you have a few sort of practical tips for people so they can think about and th- start applying them into their lives immediately to start improving their health and well-being? Well, I think I'm, I think the tip would vary depending upon the kind of person. So if you're somebody who's struggling to get enough exercise, right? If you don't get enough and you'd like to exercise more, um, I think that, you know, there's lots of things you can do, but I think the most important thing is to find somebody who, 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 who you want to exercise with, get, get an exercise buddy um, and, and, and use each other to help each other. Um, there's nothing like, you know, having a, you know, somebody who you meet for a walk or a run or whatever, and don't feel like you have to, you know, you have to go crazy, you know, some is better than none and 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 once you get better you enjoy some then you might decide that you want to do a little bit more but don't feel like there's an optimal kind of exercise or you you know whatever just you know that you have to do it don't make it you know don't make it unfun make it fun and and if you make it fun and make it part of your life and recognize also that your body has to adapt it takes time one of the problems for example of being obese is that um is that you have less dopamine response to exercise. And dopamine is the molecule that makes you want to do more. It's the reward molecule. And obesity actually down-regulates that. And so we have these expectations that all of a sudden you exercise and a week later you're going to feel great. Well, it's going to take more than a week. And, and you have to be in it for the long term, not the short term. And, and so don't do it just for the, for the health benefits. Do it for the social benefits. Do it for all the other things. And if you make it fun and part of your life, um, um, and find ways to make it necessary. Um, I think that's the most important thing that we, you know, that's the most important tip. And there are so many ways to do that. I, I for example, leave my exercise clothes out in the morning when I go to bed so that when I wake up, that's what I put on. And that like helps, it's like it removes one less barrier to, to starting my run. Because I never want to go for a run in the morning when I start. Never, ever. On no occasion whatsoever um, do I ever. And, really and, and how many marathons have you done now? I just did my 25th. Well, first of all, congratulations. But that, I think, is, is so valuable there at the end, what you said, Daniel, that you've had to find ways to remove barriers to that because you don't want to. Yeah. Yeah, you've just completed your 25th marathon. You don't want to get up and go for a run, yet you are a runner. And, right. and, and, that's, and really, I, that's really, really key, isn't it? I, I, I know it. And there's never been a time when I left the door of my house thinking, I really want to run. I always like, oh, I'm going to force myself to run. And then I always enjoy it when I come back. Um, another example is the, in my, my building, right? Um, I live in I, my, 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 my office when I get to go to it again after the lockdown. My office is on the fifth floor of this beautiful old Victorian building. And every day when I walk into the building, I want to take the elevator. Bar none. I always look at the elevator longingly. But the reason I don't take the elevator is that if anybody sees on me taking the elevator, they'll call me a hypocrite. 
And, and, and it's, so it's not because I, I'm doing it for my health. I'm doing it because, <laughs> because I have a social, I have a, I've, I've socially coerced myself into, into taking the stairs. And I never regret having taken the stairs by the time I get to the fifth floor, but I always regret taking the stairs as I head up the stairs, looking longingly at the elevator and don't, Beat yourself up for, 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 for those instincts. Those instincts, even though elevators never existed in the Stone Age, it is a completely normal, natural instinct to want to avoid exertion and don't ever feel bad about it. Typically, people will be in to see me with a specific problem. So I wouldn't say that many people are coming in well saying, hey, doc, what can I do to enhance and optimize my longevity. You do get it a couple of times, but it's not that common. So typically the attention goes to what is that person suffering from? Now, my bias is that we over-medicate in medicine, we suppress symptoms a lot, and that often if we are quite often if we're careful with lifestyle interventions, you can make big changes, not just in terms of prevention, in terms of preventing getting sick, but often when people are sick, it can make a massive improvement in their symptoms. And you know, sometimes you know you can reverse things, but I'm talking about giving patients a sense of agency over how they feel. Absolutely, which I think is really important. I think certainly in almost 20 years of practice, I'd have to say that when a patient feels as though they can't do anything, like they've just got this condition and there's nothing they can do about it. I, I just see, you know, you don't see that good outcomes there. People feel very disengaged in the process. I always want to give people a feeling that they can do something about it. Even if it's five minutes of meditation a day, it's going to help change their perception of it. Um, but often what I do is when I talk to them about those lifestyle changes, I'll also explain what that's going to do for them long term. So yes, it's about helping them in the short term with their symptoms, but also I'll say, well, yeah, but this can also like, you know, sleep, for example. Uh, I spoke to Matthew Walker on, on the podcast maybe a year ago. He's or terrific. So. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. And you know, me and Matthew were talking about some of the research that is suggesting that sleep deprivation, chronic sleep deprivation can be causative. In oh, the, absolutely. In the development of Alzheimer's. Absolutely. And, 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 and interestingly, there are many misdiagnosed cases of Alzheimer's where somebody's got memory impairment and it's, they're simply sleep deprived. Yeah, exactly. So if I had a patient who was struggling with their sleep and who also had a family member with Alzheimer's, for example, the conversation could very easily be about the things that they can do in the short term to help. But I might also bring up some of that research and say, hey, look, you know, Alzheimer's doesn't just start, you know, the six months before you get it. It's probably been going on for 20 or 30 years in your brain beforehand. And chronic sleep deprivation is one of those factors. So yeah. not only will you feel good in the short term, but you're going to help insulate yourself from potentially going down the path that your family member did. So I guess that's the context of which I might bring it up. Is that what you were getting at? Yeah, that's terrific. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in that. And it sounds, it sounds I, I agree with you completely. If I were a medical doctor, it would be, I'd be having the same conversations. Yeah, because uh, it's, 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 for me, and I wonder if you subscribe to this, Dan, that it's often the things that we can do day to day that are going to help us feel good day to day are also the sort of things that are going to help us age well, right? Yes. Although there are some funny exceptions. Uh, yeah, so, so what are those exceptions? Well, what, my favorite example of an exception is jogging. Okay. There, there's dozens of studies now that show that for every hour that you jog, you get an extra hour uh, of life. So if you're jogging five hours a week, you're going to get five hours uh, added on to the end of your life. Uh, it's a pretty robust finding. But if you unpack it a bit, if you step back and you th say, I love jogging, well, that's a good trade-off. You're enjoying it in the moment. If you hate jogging, like I do, I like power walking, I can't stand jogging. Um, why would I want to spend an hour a day now to get an hour a day later at the end of my life when I'm you know, possibly catatonic and drooling all over myself, it doesn't seem like the right trade-off. I'd rather have the hour now. If, if it was a two-to-one ratio, that'd be different, but it's not. So I guess your approach is about giving people information and letting them decide 
what they want to do with that information. Absolutely. In fact, that's that's my whole uh, thing for the through the last three books is that I I wouldn't presume to tell anybody what to do about anything. I feel that my job as a scientist uh, is to just lay out what I know about the science of various issues, whether it's productivity and creativity as in the organized mind, or the science of trying to sort out what's true and what's not in the newspaper and in Facebook posts, the field guide to lies and statistics. And here, these are the, these are the trade-offs, these are the choices. You have to decide. It's a very personal thing. Yeah, and Dan, it's it's interesting. You're saying that as a neuroscientist, but I would echo that as a medical doctor. I actually don't believe it's my job to tell anyone what to do. Um, in fact, well, I appreciate that because a lot of doctors are uh, paternalistic. They are, and I I fundamentally believe that you don't really connect and make long-term changes with someone when you are paternalistic and you tell them what to do. I guess going back to the book, because I do think it's it's really interesting and there's quite a few there's quite a few things in there that I think people listening to this podcast can start thinking about applying into their own life, which is ultimately I think the goal of, of you sharing that information with people. It's yes to educate them, but it's also to hopefully empower them to think, hey, I could start doing that, right? So Let's actually go into the sort of granular, the nitty gritty of what it is. What is the number one thing people can do to help ensure that they age well? The number one factor that influences how you're going to fare at any age is a personality trait, a mindset, uh, you might call it, of conscientiousness. That swamps all other factors uh, in terms of whether you're going to be healthy and uh, and happy at age eight or age 108. Now, th- think about it. Conscientious kids don't cross against the light, so they're less likely to get hit by a lorry. Uh, conscientious teenagers and adults are less likely to end up in prison because they follow some marginal rules. Conscientious adults go see a doctor when something's wrong. They say it hurts here, you know, and and then yeah, well, conscientious adults have a doctor, and they um, at least in the U.S. their insurance payments are, are current, and when the doctor tells them to do something, they do it. Conscientiousness, which is a cluster of traits relating to stick to itiveness, reliability, dependability, uh, doing what you'll say you'll do. That's the biggest single factor. And although it's unevenly distributed throughout the population, some people have a lot of it, some people have none. And on the one extreme, if you've got too much of it, it becomes obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, you know, compulsive hand washing or things like that. Um, you can change that as well as any personality trait or mindset quality at any age. It's never too early to start and it's never too late to start. Yeah. And that, that's super interesting because when you talk about personality, because you're basically saying the number one factor that predicts if you're going to age well is how conscientious you are. Yeah. And some people will hear that and think, oh my God, uh, I'm not that conscientious a person. So that number one factor that Dan said, and Dan, that neuroscientist said, I don't have it. But what you're then saying is that you can change your personality. Well, you can. The the whole field of psychotherapy is based on this idea. And although not all psychotherapeutic techniques work for all people, um, there's a bunch of studies coming out uh, about behavioral change uh, just to take one example, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, has been shown to be better at improving symptoms of depression and lack of conscientiousness. And it, this CBT is is not used lying on a couch and talking about your childhood and you know your mother, the relationship with your mother. It's practical tools that the therapist gives you to help you reach the goals you said that you wanted to reach, sort of like your patient's coming to you. CBT doesn't tell you what to do. They tell you how to do it. And it's been shown to be more effective than drugs, even antidepressants. And interestingly, perhaps counterintuitively, CBT alone is more effective than the combination of drugs and CBT. But it's not just therapies, uh, meditation, yoga, Finding inspiration from literature or art or, or somebody that you've read about in the news who has made a change, uh, maybe somebody in your family and saying, you know, I'm inspired by that. I'm going to do that. Super interesting, isn't it? That conscientiousness is that number one trait. 
uh, and that it's something that you can train or work on certainly at any age. At any age, which it, which is very encouraging. Now. When you were describing conscientiousness, I was thinking, okay, so someone is conscientious, uh, they're not gonna, they're gonna wait for the green man to cross the road, they're gonna go and see the doctor when they're sick. Are you talking about someone then who just follows rules? Because I guess, and I, I've read your previous book, uh, and I know you talk a lot about creativity. And, you know, there's so many benefits to being creative and uh, I guess challenging a lot of the, assumptions that are already there in society and actually, you know, sort of navigating your way around that. Is there a clash there somewhere? Can you be someone who is highly conscientious, but is also very creative and willing to challenge things? Well, I believe so. Uh, do you see what I'm getting at? I do. Yeah. I, I, cause conscientiousness, although rule following is a part of it, it's not all of it. Yeah. And there are cases where you really have to not follow a rule. Um, if, um, if you're starving, and uh, you see a roll, I mean, really starving, you're about to die, and you see a roll left out on a table in a restaurant that hasn't been picked up yet. I would say you're morally and ethically justified to pick up that roll, even though you didn't pay for it. Uh, there are all these kinds of thought experiments about ethics. Um, I think that if you had the opportunity to murder Hitler, murder is supposed to be against the rules, but you know, there's a, an argument to be made that that would have been a good thing to do. So, and these aren't, I'm not talking about creative act here. I'm talking about more practical ones. But I think of the people I know, Joni Mitchell's a good example, one of the most creative people I know. And she's very conscientious, uh, although she breaks all kinds of rules with her songwriting and her painting. She's a wonderful painter. Um, the way the conscientiousness shows up is she finishes what she starts. She'll spend months working on a single line of a song to get it just right. That's a kind of stick to itiveness. And um, she's happy to break rules in songs. For one thing, she doesn't use standard guitar tunings like yeah. everybody else does, she invents her own. Interestingly, she, this is not well known, but the reason she did it is because she had polio as a child. She doesn't have full, I can tell you this because you're a guitarist, she doesn't have the full strength of her left fingers to be able to make conventional chords. For the most part, she can only play two strings at once, kind of like Django Reinhardt. So she invents these tunings that allow her to basically take two fingers and move them up and down the neck. I would say that's an interesting case of rule breaking and conscientiousness. Yeah. I mean, that it's super interesting that that reminds me of, um, I don't know if you heard of a band called Crowded House. Sure. Neil Finn. Yeah. I Neil love Finn. Crowded House. Yeah. They, they were one of my favorite oh, bands in the too. 90s. Yeah. I, I've seen them a few times play. Don't dream it's over. Yeah. There is reason within. Yeah, exactly. There is reason without. It's such a great track. Yeah. Um, my uh, friend Mitchell Froome plays the organ on it, the B3 organ. Oh, really? Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, wow. it's amazing. Oh my, I mean, this conversation could fast go down a track of music, which I'm going to go down for a little bit because I'm super interested. The B3 is one of my favorite sounds. I think out of all musical sounds, I absolutely love it. And when it's just sitting there in the background, it's, it's just beautiful. And I think that Mitchell managed to get it as close to the timbre and the sound of um, um, Booker T., yeah, uh, Booker T. Jones. Uh, I think he he managed to get that sound, the, the Booker T. sound, Green Onions, and all that. And it's hard to do. It's it's all in the draw bars, and it's in the the micro adjustments you make with touch. Yeah, but man, I mean, he nailed it. it. It's yeah. I mean, I mean, but, and on on Crowded House, um, what was relevant in my head based upon what we said about Joni Mitchell is that. I remember seeing an interview with Neil Finn once, and he's, uh, he's uh, you know, not verbatim, but he says something like, you know, we're a four-piece band, so our limitations become our strength. So he was all, from from certainly my interpretation of what I heard was that we're going to only record stuff or play live stuff that we can do, the four of us. So we're going to have to create around that rather than bringing in extra people to be able to play this part or that part or that part. It's the opposite of a latter-day Beatles or Steely Dan approach. Yeah. They're a live band like you too. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's fascinating that Joni also, because she's she's got a limitation that lends, that, that gives her some new creativity because 
if she didn't have that, maybe she would play in standard tuning and therefore she might not be as crazy. Who knows? But it's, it's super interesting. But I guess, Dan, we are talking about aging well and the brain and you've written a book on music and the brain. Um, so I'm interested, does music play a role for us in terms of how we're aging? Well, um, yes and no. Um, we now believe that 5% of the population are, sorry for a buzzword, but anhedonic for music, meaning they, they don't get pleasure from music. And, you know, this just due to genetic variation or environmental factors. Uh, we see anhedonia, failure to receive pleasure in many domains. Some people don't like chocolate. Some people don't like sex. Uh, or being touched. Some people don't like music. But for the rest of us who do, um, there are some interesting connections between music and aging, uh, some of which are well known. Uh, if you've got Alzheimer's or uh, extreme dementia, and you no longer recognize where you are or who your friends are, you don't recognize yourself in a mirror, in many, many cases, you still recognize songs from your youth. They're preserved. And this is not just kind of a, um, a cool fact. It's an essential part of adults living with uh, cognitive impairment in, um, in relaxing them or causing them to be less agitated. Imagine what it's like if you look in the mirror, you don't recognize who it is, you were put in some home or facility after your memory impairment started, so you don't know where you are. Uh, you don't recognize the caregivers who come in every single day. Um, and often we see in these patients, as you well know, a great deal of agitation and uh, anger. And of course they're angry. They don't know where they are. But you put on the headphones, the earbuds, whatever, you play them a song from when they were 14 years old. They suddenly reconnect with themselves. There's home. There's something in their memory that they recognize, and that's who I am. This is, this is something I can get a hold of. And we find that in these cases, the, the patients as well as their families are tremendously relieved. Now, that's sort of an extreme case of music. Um, a less extreme case that's not as well known is that older adults who start to learn an instrument, or if they already play a new instrument, that learning is neuroprotective. One of the many myths that I try to bust in The Changing Mind is that uh, you can't grow new neurons after a certain age, or you can't make new neural connections. Neuroplasticity, the buzzword for making new neural connections, new synapses, that goes on your entire life. And the more you can learn, especially new things, the more neuroprotective it is because you're building up neural and cognitive reserves. So... That could be anything though, right? You just learning anything, whether it's music or sport or Absolutely. You know, but is a it new bit, language. So this sounds like one of the key things we need to be thinking about as we get older is what keep trying new things. Yeah, and in particular, there's this new appreciation for what we call embodied cognition. Uh, Barbara Traversky and Scott Grafton both have new books out about this. Scott's is called Physical Intelligence. Uh, fantastic books. The idea is that your body actually helps your mind grow through the experiences you have manipulating your body. So learning a new language is neuroprotective, but learning something that involves eye-hand coordination, um, musical instruments being one, not so much singing, but playing an instrument, or, or taking up tennis, or, or ping pong, or you know anything that involves this kind of body intelligence. Very powerful is simply going for a walk on an uneven trail. As you probably know, some Scottish doctors are now writing prescriptions yeah. for their patients. Go for a walk outside. You know, uh, it's because as you're walking on an uneven surface, your foot and your ankle and your legs are ma and your vestibular system are making dozens of micro adjustments every minute. Uh, you have to change the pressure and the angle and you have to get feedback about what's happening so you don't fall over. And it's hugely important. So would you say that, you know, would you therefore not be recommending as people age that they work out in a gym, on a treadmill, or on an exercise bike? Or can you do a bit of both? Well, you can certainly do a bit of both. Uh, I have I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, I've changed a few things in my own life. One was I didn't know about sarcopenia, 
how would I, I as I say, I, I basically know about stuff from the chin up uh, and a little bit of spinal cord. But sarcopenia is to muscle what osteoporosis is to bone. And um, so I've started doing resistance training. I go to the gym. I'm not trying to bulk up like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I do a round of 20, I'm uh, sorry, 12 different weight machines just to keep my muscles going. I spend about 40 minutes there four or five times a week. Jane Fonda has started, told me she started doing the same thing. Um, do you enjoy I, it? I do. I do. I can't, I couldn't tell you why, but I do. And I also do the elliptical because I'm trying to get my heart rate up and I do what's called high intensity interval training. But better than both of those really is the difference between sedentarism and moving outdoors. If you only do one thing, you should move outdoors. But yeah, adding the others is great. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's great because... There's a lot of information we're giving people and sometimes getting too many things to do, too many things that are great to do, can sometimes seem a bit overwhelming. You have to prioritize. Now, if you're in a wheelchair, get somebody to take you out. The visual stimulation of being in nature is neuroprotective, not as much as if you're walking. And if you can push your own wheelchair, even better, or yeah. walker. As a doctor, I know that around 90% of what we see in any given day is in some way related to stress. And I just don't think people really get stressed still and understand how stressed and how upregulated they are much of the time. In your experience, people who come to your retreats, people who seek you out for help, people you've coached, when they come and see you, what proportion of their daily life do you think they're spending upregulated compared to downregulated? compared to, let's say, an indigenous tribe who are living in nature, with nature. Can you sort of paint a picture for us of what that difference might look like? Um, I can paint it from Bruce. So Bruce Parry um, has been with so many tribes now, documentary tribes, also TY. Um, and I, I had a good chat with Bruce around the book as well, discussing... Um, Penin tribe and another tribe called the Benjeli tribes. They're mentioned in the book. They are. I love that bit with the Penin tribe. I, I just underlined it. I thought it was wonderful. Amazing story. And he, you know, and he just expressed his. He just said, "Look, you'll get it, Tony, because of this right and left hemispheres and being damn regulated and this state of meditation that they're operating in, like twenty four seven. It's like even if they're in alert states, it's it's like an alert state that we would talk through the Wim Hof method, let's say, where you're you're using an upregulating breath technique, but not to bring sh that kind of upregulation stress to become an alert state. So there's a positive to that. It might be, oh, I'm um, having a slump in the afternoon. Say we're having a slump in the afternoon. It's three thirty. I've got to jump on a podcast. I'll use another type of breath practice to just pick me up again. It just brings me up into an alert state. It doesn't mean I'm stressed out, but it's an alert. Um, tuned in practice so it's like a stressed and focused yes. as opposed to a stressed and anxious yes it's a, it's a different mindset so yeah. that's what that's what bruce was explaining that these indigenous tribes that again they're moving through a landscape but they're not separate to it they're totally tuned into the frequency of it right and that's where they're at um and if we again if we look at people that maybe turn up on retreat they've normalized they've normalized stress. It's like, that's what they operate at the whole time. So it's like these indigenous communities that Bruce is talking about are normalizing downregulation, parasympathetic. And some of the attendees I see have normalized sympathetic. And what we then do is things like um, ice baths or breathing techniques enables us with the ice bath enables us to go up, we get a peak, and then they can drop back under again. So suddenly it's like, ah, oh, there's a stressor because I've just been operating at stress, I almost need a, an even more of a peak of stress to be able to drop back under again to recognize where my parasympathetic, my more crystal clear state of mind would be. Mm -hmm. um, and I see it just from taking people again, like with the blindfolds on into the forest, you can just see a complete shift in that person's state. You can feel it. It's not just yeah. seeing it. You just feel it from like their whole aura. There's something changing within their energy. Um, I guess people know that, don't they? Most people will probably recognise the feeling, I, I guess, on a Sunday maybe when they haven't got to go yeah. to work and they haven't got anything like to do, or even on holiday, how how just they feel. And maybe a few aches and pains aren't there, you know, just th there's a relaxedness. And 
your experience of the world is very different when you're in that state. And I guess many people think, though, I can only be in that state when I'm on holiday or on a Sunday, right? Many people will listen and go, yeah, that's all right for you, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But I've got a busy life. I've got a busy job. It doesn't apply to me. What would you say to them? Um, I have a coaching business. I hold retreats. Um, I've just produced a book in lockdown, which is a I hats off to anyone that produced anything in lockdown, I believe. Um, and did two major endurance events, built a documentary around that. Um, we unschool our kids as well. So we've been doing that for many years and still managed to operate in a down regulated state. So there is this, oh, it's okay for you, mate, but there I I totally I'm totally there with you. You know, I, I live it as well. I, I live that environment. Um, it just that you can put practices within your day, you just need little reminders. And sometimes that's all it takes. It's a reminder to breathe. You know, it's a reminder maybe on the hour to say, everyone has a minute, you know, out of your hour. Take one of the minutes away and just say, okay, here's six cycles of breath just to reconnect to the breath again and to find myself within it. So let's just talk people through that because a lot of people have heard of breath work. They've heard of practices. They've, they've heard it on this show before, but... You mentioned one, the four six, yeah. right? So maybe just be super practical with people. On the hour, you're recommending that they take a pause and do four six? Four six, six cycles. And sometimes, you know what? Don't even get obsessed by the counting of it. You know, there's a breathing app I've recommended in the past and it has a sound that picks up for four seconds and another sound that drops off for six seconds. That's called breathing app. It's so simple, right? That's one. Or it can just be, um, if you put your finger on your pulse for a moment and you just inhale up through your nose, you'll notice there's a slight pickup of the pulse. As you exhale and you exhale for longer, you'll notice there's a dropping off of the pulse. So it's as long as you can inhale for and as long as you can exhale for, but just try and extend the exhale a little longer and practice six cycles. You'll be at around a minute, right? Um, prior to that, just try this. Wherever you're sitting, it could be on the floor, office chair, Wherever you are, just try and relax the pelvic basin in your lower abdomen because we're also very tense down there, right? So we're walking around very tense. So try and relax that area to begin with. Allow your jaw to settle and your heart to settle. Just tune into that very simple language. Relax the pelvic floor, the pelvic basin, the lower abdomen, the jaw, yeah. let the shoulders go and let the heart go. Even that, if you just even think of that, you're already a step there. Like immediately the moment I think of that, I'm like, oh, okay, I feel calm again. Yeah. You know, it just comes in, it drops in. And then you breathe into that space. Breathe into the relaxed jaw, breathe into the relaxed shoulders, breathe into the lower abdomen, the pelvic floor, and just allow all that being of you just to expand on the inhale. And then don't push your exhale. So you just allow your exhale to go as if... Yeah. Otherwise it turns into... And then we're tense again in the lower abdomen, the jaw and the yeah. shoulders. So it's just allowing your whole being to be inflated with an inhale and allow the breath just to leave you. And that's six cycles. That's, I mean, it's such a simple practice. It's so simple, isn't it? So like an alarm on the hour, maybe on people's phones to remind them, like even if they're post stuck. Post it, post it note, boom, up on your screen, whatever it is, just remember to breathe today. You know, it could be, it's it, just little reminders. And we do need the reminders because again, once that stuff starts kicking in the next email, the next phone call, and we find ourselves upregulated, we're already operating from a different system. Yeah. So sometimes we just need that little reminder, like a little tap on the shoulder from your favorite uncle or aunt saying, just remember to breathe now. Yeah. I mean, what I love about that practice is that there's, there's, there's literally nobody who is listening to this podcast right now who couldn't do that. It, it doesn't cost any money, right? They don't have to uh, buy anything. They don't even need to get an app, really. You, know, you don't even really need to time it, do you? It's just a rough... Yeah. Um, approximation, you know, roughly in for four, out for six, and just do that for a minute. And what benefits is someone going to get if they do that? Why should they? I honestly believe that just that, those simple practices, like the inner work, I call it, but every relationship improves from you doing the inner work, including the one with yourself, right? So that will mean that every relationship within your work environment, a home environment, will improve via that. And it could be like with the lady I'm discussing who enters her father's home, her relationship with her father improves from that, right? Mm. Just in that moment. Because again, she's seeing him differently. She's not seeing him from the 
what might have been way back there in childhood even because she's not operating at that subconscious layer it's now she's entered as a conscious adult into that experience not operating as maybe the six-year-old or the five-year-old back there right yeah. i guess your um ability to think clearly precisely you know so within a work environment what do we want we want to be on our game don't we you know we want to be able to articulate we want to be um, focused we want to be able to deliver on time or targets and you can do all of that you could have worked better you just work more efficiently right yeah. it's that's that's it that's it in its simple form but again i think it's really down to that for me it's the relationships every relationship improves and with with parenting for instance it might even be working from home i have a studio outside the house i have this really long commute these days across the lawn right but it's sometimes easy to forget that that's still a work I I environment yeah. and I'd suddenly enter the home and I'm still in the email or the phone call. So what can we do? Okay, we, we put everything down in that moment, breath work, just for a moment, a minute, then leave that experience and leave whatever it is in that space before entering the new space. Because again, the kids are waiting for you. They're waiting to see you. And who do they want to see? They want to see kind of, again, the upregulated pupper or the downregulated pupper, you yeah. know, who have they been waiting for? And an app, believe me, like an hour or two hours is like a lifetime to kids if, they, if you've been in that, in that environment. It could be, I just can do one minute of downregulation breathing where my out breath is longer than my in breath in my car. And then when you walk through the door, your interaction with your partner, with your kids, it's going to be completely different. It can stop a lot of you know, unnecessary disputes or arguments. Yeah. I mean, the other thing for me, Tony, is I hear that. Why, why I think that's such a very, such a powerful practice also is because we get to work and we just start to accumulate a lot of the time stress and what I call micro stress doses. And if you don't do anything to downregulate, you just, you just keep going, you just keep going, keep going. And then by the end of the day, when you've finished, you may not have done anything to pause to bring everything back down again so by the time you then rock up at home after work whether you're working from home or from an office you know your state is completely different and arguably not the best state to then interact with loved ones i had this moment i was staying at my friend's space in somerset we were there for six months so we got to live in like a proper community experience and there was one morning um, I, had, I had a lot on and, and I just thought, right, I'm just, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the lake. I'm just going to sit at the lake. So I walked to the lake, did some breath. And in that moment, it was this simple language of, um, it's a choice, right? So you can choose to do the breath and appreciate the privilege, or you can choose not to and feel overwhelmed. And then I realized it was just a fine line between overwhelm and privilege. And what can help me navigate that path is just a simple breathing practice. But equally, being out in nature, you know, just as we're discussing breath, just a walk within a green space or taking your shoes off and going for a walk on the lawn, you know, the study suggests that 20 minutes in a, in, a, in a natural environment will lower heart rate, blood pressure, and drop us into parasympathetic as well. What equally it has to highlight, though, a bit like the morning practice, is you know, that why are we upregulated? You know, what is it within this everyday environment that's that's doing this? You know, and, and what are the other things I could be addressing, right? You know, that could be again getting out to a green space might be one, being spending more time outdoors. We're known as this indoor species, right? This urbanite species that spends ninety to ninety five percent of our time indoors. Um, so we can look at stretching, perhaps try and find more time outside or from that natural experience of being outside and recognizing that just a small percentage of time outdoors will lower heart rate and blood pressure what can i learn from that can i perhaps journal what that experience is and what it is i'm feeling what are those things that that i feel drawn to that are doing that are lowering the heart rate and blood pressure and what can i bring into my everyday environment from that what can i learn yeah. from this out here to bring into the everyday environment because of some again it's all right for you, Tony, you might get to spend more time outside, which I get. Um, others, it's not so simple. They maybe can't get out today or can't get out tomorrow. What if, you know, it's dark immediately afterwards, you know? Yeah. And outdoors doesn't mean um, the tube, the car or the shopping center. It means actually outdoors, right? And so... Where the sky's above your head. Yeah, so, you know, what can I be doing? Maybe try and stretch it, you know, make the next tube stop to walk to or... You know, just try and try and work with that, but ultimately try and bring more of that organic experience inside the home, in those everyday environments. 
that might be what you see and what you taste and what you smell and what you feel within those environments, but it's also how we move in those environments. How can, how can we move more organically within an environment, right? Including it, the home. Yeah, it's, you know, getting off the tube one stop earlier. Often the narrative, I think, in society around health is, okay, well, you can get more movement in then. You know, you, let's say you can you can get a 20-minute walk in now. Sure. Great. And then people naturally often go to, oh, I'm ticking off my physical activity bots. Uh, what, how many calories is that going to burn? Or whatever it might be. But again, it's very reductionist, isn't it? Because that 20-minute walk could be many things. It could be you're getting natural light exposure. You might be getting a bit of sun. You might be hearing the birds, depending on where you're walking. You could be doing some breathing at the same time. It's not just one thing, is it? That 20 minute walk actually can hit multiple parameters. Yeah, you can get many needs met, right? Rather than just the, the want or the desire to get to work on time, you could flip it and just think, well, okay, what can I receive from that experience? How many of those boxes, those natural needs can I take off? Um, it can be then, oh, I feel so amazing for just doing a 20 minute walk. I tell you, what, I'm going to get up a bit earlier now and maybe walk for a bit longer, you know, and that's that's what can happen through these experiences and become more of an opportunist even along the way, right? Once you really open things up, what does it feel like? Oh, maybe I'm going to balance on the curbstone today and get some balancing in or I'm going to balance on the wall or, you know, use the stairs down to the tube instead of escalator and just add more things on. Like Yehudi, I, I, I describe in the book, Yehudi's like, he's 82 now. Um, I think I discussed him on the last podcast, but his commute, right, was that he'd wake up in the morning, anyway, he'd have his whole practice at home. And so he'd have um, an office experience at home where he'd set it up. There were mats there, so he had no chair. He'd ground sit. Um, he'd answer his emails either on the ground or standing. He'd have a pull-up bar so he could hang from before entering the office. It was in one of those positions where it's always there, so he knew he would do it. Um, kitchens are great for that, right? You can pull up bar in the kitchen so you know whenever you enter, oh, I can hang while the kettle's boiling. And then he'd walk in his Vivo barefoot shoes, right? So he's getting his feedback from his feet and his feet can behave how they're meant to behave. Get to the tube. People would normally say, um, well, would, you like, would you like a seat? And he went, no, no, I'm okay. And as soon as the train starts moving, he's either hanging off the rail above, right? So he's hanging while the train's moving or he's surfing, right? So surfing would mean not holding on to anything and just working like, so the tube becomes like a huge power plate, right? Where you have to stabilize, great for the hips. And that would be his experience. And then he'd walk up the stairs. And this, you know, it's just, that's that's where you can take it. And that's uh, yeah, that started happening for him when he was 78 and he's now 82 and he's thriving in terms of his capacity to move now, right? I mean, that is... It, it's such a powerful story. It's empowering for um, anyone who thinks, you know, is it too late? Have I lost a lot of my natural movement? You know, what can I do? You know, wh when did he start seeing you? Was it, did you say 17? Well, no, he actually started seeing me. This be a big, big journey. He st first started seeing me when he was 72 and he wanted to learn how to walk. So he was... And why did he want to learn how to walk? Did he feel, I can't walk properly anymore? Well, this is a massive story to unpack, but he um, he had a stooped posture, you know, like really head chasing, collapsed in the chest from yeah. sitting I didn't realize this at the time, but anyway, he wanted to learn to walk. So I said, okay, let's pop you up on the treadmill and I'll record you because unless someone shows you a video of you walking, you really have no idea. You're kind of subconsciously incompetent at that stage. And what the video will do is just make you consciously incompetent. <laughs> and then we can do some practices and then readdress it and then, you know, and then record it again a bit later. And then suddenly that becomes your new template, your new subconscious competence, let's say, through that model. Um, introduce him to ground sitting, um, Vivo, as I mentioned. So those studies are profound, aren't they? That we know that um, sixty percent of foot strength. Um, notice it's, it's Professor Dort, I think his name is from yeah. the University of Liverpool, right? Within six months of wearing Vivo barefoot shoes, their foot people's foot strength had developed by sixty percent, right? Yeah. But also balance had increased by forty percent. And, and I just want to, because I love that study, and I, you know, I'm a huge fan of Vivo barefoot shoes. Yeah. They're the ones I wear. My wife, my kids. I'm either barefoot or in Vivos, uh, probably very much like you. And that study, what I love about it is, it wasn't about running. No, a lot of people hear barefoot shoes yeah, and they yeah. think, oh, I've got to be able to run. Immediately, it's like, hold on, hold on. This is just living in barefoot shoes. You know, going to the shops, walking around. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? within a six month period. So if you think about that from a parenting perspective, what that means f as a parent, okay, and we all want the best for our kids and we want to create these solid foundations for our kids and foundations for life, right? Um, 
it's saying that if you wear compromising footwear, you're going to remove 60% of your foot strength and 40% of your balance. <laughs> Essentially, that's what it's saying, right? It's also saying that after billions of pounds that's been spent in the sports science world for developing footwear, which is mainly for aesthetics and not athleticism, let's say, if we can understand this model, is where has that got us? But, but equal, I think for this parental thing, it's like understanding, well, you know, think about the potential that's perhaps lost, hmm. right? And if we look at um, things like physical education, we already know that if you're the youngest in the class, you, you, there's a, you're at a disadvantage for the older kids when it comes to physical education and PE, right? So there's already this feeling of inadequacy when it comes to sports, perhaps, and PE in later life. But then we're saying we're removing also 60% of foot strength and 40% of balance, you know. But with Yehudi's case, he... Um, he yeah so introduce him to vivo so again, again foot strength would improve balance would improve of course naturally uh, without working naturally. on it just, just by actually yes. not compromising your footwear and being in touch with the grounds so that's removing so that's operating at the cause level right you know and really understanding that because you can do all the foot practices you like strengthening your feet balancing work but if you keep putting them in the same environment that compromising in the first place it's merely symptom relief and quick fixes are further distractions than the truth. You need to get into the real cause and often it's, it's simply the shape of the foot. You know, it's the environment really that yeah. we need to work at and the environment for the foot in modern society is the shoe, is it not, right? So with Yehudi, that foot strength had improved, balance had improved. His overall understanding of his posture had improved because it removed the chair and got him back to mobilizing areas that are designed to be mobile and creating stability in areas that are essentially designed for stability. And also bringing the squat back, so squatting instead of sitting, so that his mind could understand where his weight should be when he stands up even, let alone when he walks, right? Um, but later on, as times passed, Yehudi then said, well, the reason I wanted to learn to walk is because I wanted to go to Everest Base Camp for my 50th anniversary with my wife. So that's why he'd taken on that challenge. Mm -hmm. Did Everest Base Camp, did Mount Kenya, Bhutan, um, Atlas, in his late 70s. In his late 70s. This is closer to 80. And then at 79, um, he came on a workshop of mine, which was originally, um, well, it's now called the 100 Human Experience, but originally it was called Move, Breathe, Chill, which was movement and play and breath work and then ice baths. And Yehudi was terrified, right? Properly terrified of the cold. So it took me about an hour the night before the workshop. I mean, he'd agreed to it days before, but an hour the night before to convince Yehudi to come the next morning. Mm. Yehudi also lived the closest to the workshop. It was in Camden. He lived in Hampstead. People traveling from all over. And he was still managed to be late, right? But once we got him through the breath work and the play, and the play is great for that because it enters this playful state of mind and it breaks down all the armor in a way and um, we become much more open and we become much more open to the breath so the breath goes right in very quickly and he was first in the ice bath right first one in and he let out this huge primal roar i mean like screaming from the belly was coming out of this man then stepped out and he thought he was done i said no we're going to go back in again i think we need to go back in and got him in again and then since then um yehudi has been going to um either hampstead ponds or the river lee five mornings a week um, for two years now, right? To make sure you're taking action after watching this video, I've created a free guide to help you build healthy habits. We can all make short-term change, but can those changes become a fundamental part of our life? Often they don't. And that's why in this free guide, I share with you the six crucial steps you need to take. They're really, really effective. If you want to get hold of that free guide right now, all you have to do is click the link in the description box below. So he's 82, so like 80 Again, to 82. Like the practices, like, it, you know, we think, oh, it's too late for me or it's too late for them. I can't start this now. I'm already... We're talking about someone in the late 70s. He's not alone. I mean, I, there's a number of my clients that are past their 70s, mid 70s pluses that have been told, you know, not to take their knees past their toes. And they're now in deep range squats, low gate walking, balancing on rails. And for me, again, it's incredibly inspiring yeah because it changes my template even of what the 70s and 80s are right because my personal understanding 70s is looking at my grandparents 
or even 50 pluses at one point, you know, where it was like, it was just like normal to groan as you sit back in the chair or something, yeah. or groan to get out of the chair. And here we are witnessing empowered 70 to 80 year olds doing yeah. quite profound things. But are they that profound? Or are they again, naturally normal, just we've, we've become um, distanced from the path, perhaps? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm so on board. I, I, can't shake this idea of an 82 year old chap on the tube in London in between <laughs> stops hanging from the rail or squatting. Yes. I, I think it's wonderful. And I think that for me brings up some interesting points. Monday night I was at Edinburgh last night of my book tour. And um, I was coming back on the train yesterday and the train got canceled and there was all kinds of, I had to take three trains instead of one train. It was all unplanned. And yeah, I was pretty chilled about it actually, which is, uh, you know, when you practice these sort of things, I feel you naturally, you know, I, I feel I'm a lot more down regulated these mm. days naturally. And therefore, I just be a lot more. And I'm like, oh, mm. train's cancelled. Okay, cool. Well, it's going to be what it's going to be. And then in the final leg, I thought, actually, Tony's coming tomorrow. Let me get back <laughs> into his book a little bit more. I'd, I'd been reading it over the weekends. And that was reading about Yehudi. And this was a busy kind of local train. It was coming into office time. A lot of people, there was no chairs and stuff. And I thought, yeah, Tony's coming tomorrow. I'm going to squat. And so for the last hour, um, I, in between the, uh, you know, sitting carriages, you know, I was squatting against the wall and just reading your book and then listening to some music or whatever. I was rested against the wall. And, you know, after about 10 minutes, I was a bit stiff. So I'd stand up for two or three minutes and I, then I popped back down again. Yeah. The thing is, a lot of people will think, oh my God, what will people think? People are going to stare at me. I, I don't recall anyone looking at me. Like genuinely, like people are so tied up in their own worlds and their own podcasts and their own music and their own books. I think that's empowering that actually no one gave two hoots. You know, I always go, with, it's none of my business what other people think of me, right? And also, you'll be surprised that if people are looking at you, how do you know that they're just not being inspired by you? Why do we immediately go to the negative of, oh, they're going to think I'm oh, this crazy man on the tube? They might be inspired, you know? And again, I, I'm inspired by someone like Yehudi who's be hanging off the tube rails and squatting. How could you not be inspired by that? You're not going to look at, at someone in their 80s and go, look that crazy 80-year-old hanging off the rails and squatting. You're going to think legend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there, there's that. And I, I think also it's a cultural thing. Like Our kids are now going to this uh, forest school. It's a group of parents that live where we live, and we kind of done something together and created something for them to attend on a Thursday. And... Um, one of the dads was there and he'd listened to our podcast way back and said, oh, no way. You're Katerina and Tony and was talking about ground oh, sitting. Oh, fantastic. And again, was discussing this, the, oh, how do people react to it? And Katerina said, well, it depends where you are, where you are in the world, because some cultures, that's what they do. It's just our, our, where we are in the West, perhaps. It's our own lens of how we see it. You know? Yeah. Has anyone ever said anything to you negative? Not negative. I've never had anything yeah, negative. There you go. Even walking around, you know, and being better. I mean, sometimes I, I mean, I have had kids kind of be like, well, Papa, why is that man running around with no shoes on? And, and, but nothing really, not really negative. Sometimes some strange, I guess, strange kind of looks of what's he doing over there? But then again, I, it's how it's received, right? Mm -hmm. Again, what if we're receiving that upregulated versus receiving it downregulated? How about try and do the practices but work on your breath while you're there? And it might change the lens of which you, you're receiving that look. It might be suddenly that's a positivity look rather than a yeah. negativity look, a judgmental look. And when it comes to judgment, more often than not, we're judging others for judging us, not them judging us. Yeah. You know? It, it, <laughs> you know, it's... You know, when you are concerned or overly concerned with what other people think, usually, if not always, it comes from a place of an insecurity, doesn't it? When you don't think enough of yourself. Um, you know, for, for me, as a, as a fellow barefoot uh, shoe wearer and someone who literally has his shoes off as much as I possibly can, it's really interesting a lot of people who listen to this podcast now wear Vivos because Vivo have been supporting the show for, for a few years and I, I talk very passionately about them. And 
What's really interesting for me, at the event in Edinburgh on Monday night, a lot of the time in the book signing keys afterwards, people show me their vivas. Like, hey, look, yeah. you know, I'm wearing it. It's really, it's really nice. And they're like, oh man, I don't have my back pain anymore. I don't have my knee pain. Thank you so much. All this stuff. It's brilliant, then, right? There was two really lovely women at one point who said, you know, they've just got to make better looking female shoes, you know, then I'll wear them. And first of all, I, you know, this is a, this is something I had with my own wife a few years ago. She's like, you know, but she's been wearing them probably four or five years now and wouldn't go back, you know, once you experience them. And I think they do look really good now, actually. I think compared to maybe 10 or 15 years ago. It's, oh, yeah. But I think this is a really interesting point. Like if you look at the research on minimalist shoes, you've mentioned, you know, one of those studies from the University of Liverpool. I know, I think it's Professor Irene Davis and yeah. Um, in America, it talks about as soon as you put a human in a cushioned shoe, their gait changes straight away, right? You you denormalize or you it's you you changing how you walk. It's come through animal studies as well. They show it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then and then you think, well, I think, well, once you know that, and, and I want to talk to you about feet in just a second, and they are so important to every aspect of who we are. For me, through the lens with which I look at the world, which is, well, why on earth would I wear cushions every day if I know what that's doing to me? But I understand, and many people, yeah, they're persuaded, they give it a go, and they're like, oh, man, you know, I'm actually enjoying walking more now because I can feel the ground mm. a lot more. And then they're not quite as disconnected, but some people are still very much off the view. Yeah, man, but they don't look normal. They don't have that kind of pointed end that I'm used to. Or, And I guess what I'm trying to get to, to be as inclusive as possible, you know, I, I think everyone should try at some point minimalist shoes, Viva or whatever brand you want, right? Try and just see it for yourself how you feel. Have you had resistance to that? Have you had uh, clients who come in and go, look, I'll do the other stuff. Oh, man, that's not my thing. Or, or does it almost self-select when people want to work with you that they're already in tune with that way of thinking? Yeah, I have much more compassion these days, like in my coaching. When I first started out on this journey, I used to be quite strict. It used to be, well, you know, if if you're not prepared to change shoes, then I can't really coach you because the whole point is that, you know, if we understand the behavior of the foot, 33 articulations, 26 bones, 100 muscles, tendons, and ligaments, and all the receptors within the feet, 200,000 extra receptors and how that feeds and nourishes the whole posture and all the joint actions above it and the muscular actions above it are in tune with that, then you'll be super efficient and minimize the risk of injury. If you're not prepared to do it, then, it's, then we're really just offering symptom relief. I'm happy to give you symptom relief, but really th this, is, this is where it's at. Um, and I think over time, it's just, here's the conversation, this is it you know, and allow it to just settle a bit, plant the seeds at least, you know. And the beauty of this work now is we do have those studies there. You know, not many people have heard of that study. And for me, that's it's quite profound mm. to understand that 60% of your foot strength will improve over a six-month period. That can be, okay, if you're not prepared to change it, and I get it. Even my Lola and Millie and Tallulah have started putting Lego blocks in the back of their socks to be like high heels, right? And they're unschooled. It's not like they're even in a school environment. Katarina doesn't wear heels. Just it's it's within. It's just within it. They're observing it somewhere. Um, and am I going to say no? Take those blocks out of your heels. And no, of course I'm not. You know, it's just an experience. They're playing with something. Um, but it's also understanding that probably a large proportion of the day they are barefoot or they're in vivo barefoot. So what can you do? Okay. Um, could be an unavoidable sitting scenario like now, right? We're sitting, right? Um, do we alienate sitting or uh, it's the devil's work sitting and smoke sitting is the new smoking. It's, well, there are unavoidable sitting scenarios. You drive a car, get a flight, you know, in an office environment, it's not appropriate to sit on the floor. And for some environments, they won't even allow a standing desk. So, what do we do? It's what we do outside of that. The the places where we can possibly take responsibility or control of what we can take control of. So when you arrive home and you're behind the door, then get the shoes off. And then there's certain toe practices, what we call toga or yoga for your feet, that you can then do, which will then help unravel or deconstruct some of that. Um, yeah that environment that you've created, which unfortunately does compromise the foot and the behaviors above it, you know, but it's amazing how much you, you, the environment influences our behavior, doesn't it? Not only the environment we see around us and what we think is normal, 
um, or, yeah. or typical, I should say, rather than, because you obviously talk a lot about this concept of biologically normal. Yeah. Um, but cu culturally, you know, we may have touched on this when you came on the show a few years ago, but in most Indian families, you take your shoes off before you come in. That's obviously my cultural upbringing, which yeah. a lot of people certainly in, in the UK and, and America don't have it. It's it can be very different, right? And so, have you found there's a difference? Do you, do you get clients from different cultures, different parts of the world, and have you found that actually their willingness to How they respond engage yeah. is different depending on their belief system? Yeah, it's an interesting one with footwear in the home, isn't it? You know, and some some haven't actually taken their footwear off. It could be a whole day experience. So even that, as I say, it's it's suddenly changing that template that within the home, let's just at least try and get that barefoot environment. Yeah. Change, flip the perception of that one environment. Um, and yes, some people are much more responsive to others. It's what's normalized. It's whatever those templates are and how long you've had that experience or what you've observed in your earliest years even play out within that. Yeah. I you mean, know? there's even... You know, we say you said office environment where you can't do that much. You know, we thought long and hard, you know, in this new studio, it's like, okay, well, I'm gonna sit here maybe for two hours with someone having a deep conversation. I don't want them to feel uncomfortable. I don't want to feel uncomfortable myself. Um, yet there's also a certain expectation of what should a chair be in a studio where someone's coming, right? Yeah. And uh, so I have this uh, move man here. I don't know if you know move man, no. but it's awesome because it's an unstable seat. Yeah. So I have to, by default for this hour, two hours, my move, postural man. muscles. Yeah, I think it's M you've, yeah, move man, yeah. exactly. I have to move, man. I have to move and and, yeah. and this is, I think a lot about movement. I, I, I'd love your perspective on this. But the fact that I can't slump and stop engaging my muscles, Yes, it means that whenever I finish, I have never had an ache. Like, mm. never. I just simply walk up. It's like, yeah, I feel great because my muscles have been engaging the entire time. Um, but I also think that this helps me think more clearly throughout the conversation. So I'm not, you know, if, if I'm stagnating into a chair, my, my lymph, my blood, everything's sort of stagnating, right? And then that chair that you're sitting in, you know, we got what we consider the best ergonomic chair for people to at least, because I thought, should I give my guests a move, man? I thought, wrong. well, the problem is, is if they're not used to that, it could be really uncomfortable. So instead of engaging with the conversation, they can just be thinking about how they're sitting and they know there's cameras here. Do you know what I mean? How, how would you think about that? I've, with someone at the moment, um, I had someone come and see me, it's about your height, Stuart, his name is. And um, he had a furniture business, like auditorium kind of lecture chairs. And um, I'd seen his sister originally. She was like this yogi living off grid in Portugal, came with a back condition very quickly. One session out the door, done. I need to send you my brother. Brother come, Stuart. And he just said, um, do you think there's a chair in this stuff, Tony? Because I took him through simple ground resting positions that are in the book. They're just a simple series of ground sitting from kneeling to sitting cross-legged to shin boxing. To, um, and each one of those you know, a prerequisite almost of how we stand, let's call it. They're almost like the motor skill milestones of what it is we do as children before we stand up. So we then, I, we parked that conversation and it must have been two years went by. I said, I have the idea. He's like, what? I said, I know the chair. So we're going to, I have it. So we went through this whole design. So we're at the point we're ready to launch that very soon. Um, and that then is a platform that's at normal seat height and you can perform six different rest positions that you could normally perform on the ground. And you're hundred percent right. It's about move man. It's like this understanding that, well, there should be certain signals to move anyway. You know, if we've been in a position for too long, yes, we're stagnating. What does that mean for, for the, think of flow states. What, what does stagnation have to do with a flow state? You know, I'm stagnant versus flow. I mean, they're completely different ends of the spectrum, right? So it's enabling, I guess, that movement to be really fluid, um, which then ticks the box of earlier conversation about within an environment of work. What do we want to be on our game? Don't we want to be super sharp? Um, and I think with this sitting conversation, it's it's yeah, it's individual specific again, isn't it? There's a template there of what we've normalised. So what we've tried to do with this particular chair is you can sit on it like an everyday chair, 
but right. equally you can be in certain positions which if you don't have the mobility it can be adjusted and then over time you can start to gain the range one of them being the squat that has a central sitting pillar that and the base goes up and down so you'll start to gain more and more range in the ankle and the hips over time um, but yet you can always be at desk level so it then brings that ground sitting conversation into every office environment you know yeah and and then and then where do we go from there? And then we have standing desks. I think you know it can be just as detrimental to stand with poor posture as it is to sit with poor posture. So the standing desk isn't always the answer. If you look at my dad's an engineer, um, precision tool maker, and the most shocking posture from standing all day, working over screens and working mm. over and f and working with materials that he has to for his trade. Um, if you're still working over a desk and you're still stooped. Um, wh where does that lead us so it's just understanding there's certain postures or shapes that we should be adopting which help as prerequisites to standing um, and the other conversation is around muscles need to learn how to switch on and off so it's it's not great to be in one rest position for too long whatever that is whatever that is so it's choosing a different shape and normally as i say in ground rest position you get a signal it'll be a signal ah oh, this is a little bit uncomfortable now let's move and you shape shift in this in a normal chair or on a sofa we don't necessarily get that yeah and we start to stagnate as you say so that means that there is no muscles or muscles off we've just it's either on incredibly on to try and stabilize something or it's just off and both states over time can lead to atrophy. If a muscle's on for too long, on, 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 it will atrophy over time. Um, Swiss balls were like an example of that, where people are just sitting on Swiss ball for a period of time. You'd be so on to try and stabilize yeah. that you're not giving yourself the rest opportunity within that. There are two major predictors of our happiness, our health, maybe even our longevity, and that's the frequency and the quality of our contact with other people. Why are those two things so important? Hmm. Well, frequency has to do with this observation that when we don't keep current with each other, with the really important people in our lives, that perfectly good relationships can simply wither away from neglect. And the quality has a lot to do with what actually is restorative and energizing about relationships, which is um, the sense of um, relationships being stress reducers, the sense of relationships being energizers, um, affirmers of our identity, so many different things that we get in a positive way uh, from good quality relationships. So it is, it's frequency and quality. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating because I think if, if I take a step back and think about your book, think about your research, it's incredible how front and centre relationships are. I think if you walk out on the street and you were to talk to people about their, let's say their longevity, right, their, their health, both now and into the future, what's important, I think many people would immediately go to things like nutrition, mm -hmm. physical activity, sleep, for example. Yet you guys are making the case that sitting above them all, potentially the quality of our relationships. Yeah, it's remarkable. I mean, I think we were surprised when we started to find how important relationships were for our physical health. And then when we started to look at other studies, and it's the loneliness research that's maybe the most compelling now that you see these incredible links with the amount of time that people spend on the earth, the amount of time that they live. It's just extraordinary. And that relationship is of a similar magnitude to the things that we commonly think about as serious health risks like smoking and obesity. So there's so many indications of how powerful relationships are. I think we take them for granted. And it's clear science is telling us that they're important. Hmm. So you mentioned their relationships and physical health. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where some people have to make a leap into the dark, right? I get it. Good relationships feel good. Mm -hmm. Okay. We enjoy ourselves when we're in the company of people that we like, who mean something to us. But how does that then impact our physical health? 
Well, that's the interesting research question. So we're always asking, if we see a connection between one thing and another, how does it work? What's the mechanism? And probably the best hypothesis that we have, for which we have the most evidence, is a hypothesis about stress, that good relationships help us regulate emotion, particularly negative emotion. So stress is there all day long. I mean, something upsetting happens to me and I can literally feel my body change, go into fight or flight mode. And what we know is that when we have someone we can talk to, when I can go home and complain to my wife about my day, I can literally feel my body calm down. Um, and what we know is that loneliness and social isolation are stressors, um, that we evolved to be social animals. So if we are too alone, what we think happens is that we stay in a low level fight or flight mode. The body doesn't return to equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And that means higher levels of circulating stress hormones like cortisol, higher levels of chronic inflammation. And those things can gradually break down multiple body systems, which is how you could get a connection between relationships yeah. and arthritis or between relationships and cardiovascular disease, because the stress hypothesis posits that these connections are with multiple body systems. Yeah, there's some powerful research in the book that you share. I mean, there's multiple <laughs> bits of research that you share in the book. But one I particularly was drawn to, perhaps because I've been a caregiver for much of my adult life, mm -hmm. was the research on wound healing mm -hmm. and caregivers. I wonder if one of you could elaborate on that and, and yeah. sort of tell us what does that show us? Yeah, so this is remarkable research done by uh, a husband and wife team, actually. It's Janice Kiko Glazer and Ron Glazer. And what they did is they studied wounds. They did a kind of standardized wound that they put on people's forearms. It was like a punch biopsy, but a shallow one. And they photographed that wound across days to see how quickly people would heal. And what they found, this is now in a number of studies. So one example is caregivers of folks with dementia, their wounds healed more slowly than folks that didn't have that stress burden. So we see a connection between our stress levels and the nature of our relationships and how quickly our body heals itself, which is quite extraordinary. In other research, they've also found that people who are in more positive marital relationships, ones that have less conflict or more satisfying, their wounds will actually heal quicker. The punch biopsy, was it nine days? It was something pretty significant. Yeah, a big difference. Yeah, yeah. it was yeah. nine days. And you mentioned marriage there. I think there was a statistic in the book about, this is it, I wrote this down, marital happiness at age 50 was a better predictor of good physical health than I think the level of cholesterol. Exactly, in our yeah. study. Yep. So that was the first, that was an early sign in our study that there might be this connection between relationships and how people aged. And that was related both to their physical health and their mental health in their 80s. Um, so extraordinary finding. We were kind of surprised about it. We, you know, is this something unusual about our sample? Is this something that other studies are, are showing as well? And sure enough, when you look at other studies, there's more and more research from a variety of perspectives and types of research that suggests this intimate connection between relationships and physical health. Yeah. It goes both ways, doesn't it? Relationships sure. and stress. Yeah. Because good quality relationships help buffer us from stress. But at the same time, you know, poor relationships can be a major source of stress, right? Yes. And so let's talk about the study that you guys are guardians of and directors of. What can we say about poor quality relationships? Because it would be wonderful, wouldn't it, if all our relationships were great. We can say, oh, relationships are important, so I'm going to prioritize them, spend more time on them. Yeah but not all relationships are nourishing. Absolutely. Absolutely right. So, I mean, one thing's important, like we, we think about for us, Bob and I, very exciting, this research that suggests these physical pathways between relationships and our physical health. So things like inflammatory responses and immune responses, you know, it's sexy, exciting, it's the frontier, but there are other mundane things that good relationships do for us as well. So, you know, my wife reminds me, did you go to your medical appointment? Did you make your medical appointment? Did you, you know, go to the gym this week? So there are behavioral changes that also flow from close connections, people reminding us to be responsible and healthy. And the opposite is definitely true, that if you're in a relationship 
relationship that's filled with tension. It's a source of stress. And it's also uh, the, the kind of support that we get. And it's an incredible range of support that we can get from relationships. We can talk more about the types. Um, but if we don't get that from our relationships, we suffer. And it yeah. can't moderate those stressors that we find. Yeah. There's some research that suggests that being in a really toxic, acrimonious marriage is more hazardous to your health than being divorced. And so there, it doesn't come from our study. We haven't done those specific studies about negative relationships and their impact on health. Although we certainly have a great deal of anecdotal evidence and a lot of life stories that, that bear this out. But there is some study that suggests that the degree of acrimony has a lot to do with health breakdown over time. Yeah. Let's just take a step back for a moment. I've mentioned this study a couple of times in our conversation, but I wonder if one of you can explain to me, my audience, what is this study and why is it so important? As far as we know, this is the longest study of human life that's ever been done. The longest study of the same people. It began in 1938 began as two studies that were unaware of each other. One was a study of Harvard College undergraduate students, 19-year-old young men who were chosen by their deans as fine, upstanding specimens. And the other was a study of boys, often average age 12, uh, from uh, the, not just the poorest families in the Boston of 1938, but the most troubled families each family was known on average to five social service agencies for problems like domestic violence, parental mental illness, physical illness, extreme poverty. So very privileged group and a very underprivileged mm. group. Total of 724 men. And then we brought in their spouses and we have brought in all their children, more than half of whom are women. So now we have some gender balance as well. And... So this has now been going on for 85, 85 years. years. 85 years. That's phenomenal. I was actually talking to my kids over the weekends because I was chatting about who's coming to the studio, what's the topic, and they, they, they love interacting with this kind of stuff. And I said, do you guys know what a scientific study is? And, you know, they came up with <laughs> their, their ideas of what it was. And I said, well, you know, most of them are probably two weeks or four weeks and some really long ones tend to be 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. How long do you think this study is that Bob and Mark are going to talk about? And, you know, my daughter was, I don't know, daddy, one year, two years. I said, no, a bit more, 10 years. And, you know, then I told her it's 85 years. It, it's pretty remarkable, isn't it, that you were able to do this and it's still going on. So clearly, uh, looking at you both, I don't think you were both alive. We were not. Uh, 85 years ago. So could you maybe explain how that works, where there's still a study going on, but now you guys are leading it? Yeah. So it, it, you know, it's a combination of luck and, and perseverance. So this is a study, both of these separate studies began as studies that were going to go a few years and would answer the questions that they began to address quickly or relatively quickly. And through sort of luck and kind of incredible leadership over the year, the study continued. You need funding to continue a study like this. So the funding would go dry at different points and the study would figure out ways to keep going. And it's kept going now for over eight decades, which is just incredible. What's amazing amazing about it is it allows us to track people's lives in real time as they go forward. So the lives of these teenagers in Boston and the students at Harvard, we had guesses. The researchers back in the 30s had guesses about how their lives would turn out, but we've been able to follow them through their entire lives, through their you know, adulthood, middle adulthood, old age uh, to the end of life, and, and now they're children. Um, so a lot of it is luck. Uh, Bob took over the study about 20 years ago 20 at years. this point. Um, can I just ask, Bob, before you respond there, what what is that process like of taking over? Because the previous director would have presumably have had their methods, their ideas. Like, how can we keep consistency going when a director changes? Well, George Valiant was the third director, and he was my professor in medical school. Oh, wow. He lectured to my first year medical school class about these men who were then in their 
fifties, forties or fifties. And I thought this is the coolest thing in the world, but never dreamed. I dreamed be he'd be the director one the day. Study. And one day he took me out to lunch and said, how would you like to inherit the Harvard study of adult development? And I nearly dropped my fork and <laughs> said, I don't know anything about old people. Cause by then they were old and I study couples and he didn't miss a beat. He said, let's study older couples. And that was our first Grant, wow. that was our first project. But, you know, part of what was so good about George's vision was that he delighted in our bringing in new methods. I mean, when we started, they had never even been audio taped, let alone videotaped. And certainly they had not had blood drawn for DNA. They had not been put into MRI scanners. So George applauded our doing all of that as a way of bringing new methods to study the, the same essential domains of life. And, and the other thing that's important, I think George had this capacity to, to really, he was so motivated to understand the experience of participants, to really sort of get in their heads, to understand sort of what motivated them, how they thought about things, what their daily experience was like. And that's really been a hallmark of the study since the 1930s, that when we look back in the files, there are copious notes from interviews. They weren't audio taped, as Bob suggests, but they're copious notes. So this was a study that was always interested in people's lived experience and Bob and I certainly share that interest and motivation. It's one of the great things about this data set as it's accumulated over 85 years, you get to know people inside out from these interviews. Yeah, it's fascinating. I was, I was reflecting on your work uh, this morning before you came to the studio. And I was thinking about medicine, you know, my job as a doctor. And I, I've been thinking that one of the greatest privileges about being a doctor is that you are allowed into people's lives. You hear yeah. things, you, you know, they share with you things that they probably wouldn't share with many people they didn't know personally and intimately yet. For some reason, you get that insight, which is an incredible privilege, which of course allows you to help them and understand what's going on. And then I thought, well, back in 2015 and 2017, I had the very fortunate opportunity to, to make a series of BBC documentaries called Doctor in the House. Mm -hmm. And what happened in, in those documentaries is there were people within families who were sick and were under doctors and specialists, yet they were still struggling. And I went into their house to live alongside them for four to six weeks. Wow. Mm -hmm. And through the process was able to help all of these families get significantly better from a variety of different conditions they were struggling from, yep. mostly through changes to their lifestyle. But where the connection is to your work is, and I was really thinking about this this morning, I say, why do I have a slightly different perspective on health than many of my conventional colleagues? And I think I've always had that, but I also think that the experience of going into people's houses was very unique. To do that for six weeks with cameras running and you know, you're recording everything. Yeah, amazing. It's a very unique experience. And and I don't think I realized at the time how much I learned. Because on reflection, I now remember seeing how relationships, how like, let's say I had 10 minutes with a patient. Let's say I was lucky and I got 20 minutes or 30 minutes in my consultation room. Yeah, I might get a bit more information, but I wouldn't see how the family interacted, mm -hmm. how the husband spoke to the wife, how the wife spoke to the husband. And I remember starting to draw all kinds of connections thinking, oh, wow, this relationship is having a negative impact on your health. This relationship is why you are then needing to comfort eat and why you were, you know, in terms of these downstream behaviors, a lot of them are downstream from the quality of our relationships. And I thought your study for 85 years, that's actually turning it up, you know, to 11 on, on another scale, you're actually seeing and you're, you're, you're getting to know the quality of these people's lives, that the total quality, the 360 degree quality in a way that no doctor could ever do in a consultation room. 
Well, I think what you did is extraordinary too, right? To go into their homes for that length of time. But the study began with home visits from the the study itself sent folks to the homes of all the participants, the teenagers and the college students and interviewed their parents, watched what they were like when they interacted with their parents. And I think part of what's so powerful about it is that we know Bob and I met actually working in a community mental health setting, which brought psychotherapy out into the community, got outside of the office that we know that people aren't always the same as they are when they come to medical offices, yeah. right? So that's the amazing yeah. recognition. And to be interested in that and to see people, as you described, just an incredible privilege. We certainly feel it working with the study. Yeah. You know, one of the things we, we mostly do is live our professional lives in silos. And, um, you know, so to be able to do a deep dive into someone's life, into their home, or in our cases, in, into 85 years of a family's life, is such a privilege. And then in addition, I mean, so for example, I sit every day and I speak to at least two people in depth in psychotherapy, taking deep dives into their lives. And every day I sit on a meditation cushion and I watch everything that comes up in my own mind and body. And these are different ways of knowing the same thing, which is essentially the human condition. And I think once we start to break down those silos, and once we start to let each one inform the other, mm. um, we realize that there's a much more richness than we can get if we just stay within our lanes, right? Yeah. And so our, the questions we ask in the research are informed by clinical work. They're, for me, informed by Zen. Um, the, you know, and so many ways in which things fortunately bleed into each other more and more. Yeah. But that combination, right, so important. I mean, I think this idea about sitting on a cushion, observing yourself, being reflective, so important to learn about ourselves and to use that information to understand others as well. But yeah. the combination Bob is talking about of, of doing that with psychotherapy, understanding others, it's it's uh, really important. And very for us, it's been very enriching and, and certainly promoting of incredible growth. I mean, Bob, you've been the director now for, is it 20 years, a bit yeah. more than 20 years? And if you had one minute with someone, what's the, what, you know, the elevator pitch, if you were going to tell someone in one minute, what are the key things that you have learned from this study about the human experience? What would you say? I would say, take care of your body like you're going to need it for a hundred years and invest in relationships. It's the best payoff you'll get throughout your life. Love it. It was um, under 15 seconds. That was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> and Mark, how would you answer that same question? I, I, I certainly would say similar things to Bob, but I also would say there's a, a kind of basic humanity that we all have when we look hard enough at the at folks' lives and really try to understand what their experience is. There's a commonality. We're human. We're all human. And that comes through when we look at these lives across time. The, these, these men, boys grew up very different circumstances, right? Boston, inner city kids, they weren't that far away from Harvard university, but their lives were so extraordinarily different. But when we trace the arc of their lives, when we look carefully there, there are a lot of commonalities in their experience yeah. that are just extraordinary. So. Yeah. And, and one of the things I, I I love about your book, I mean, it's a wonderful book. I, I, I honestly can't imagine anyone who wouldn't get something from reading it. It's mm. because you're talking about the human experience. We all have relationships. We only exist in relation to other people, don't Absolutely. we? But the stories you share... I was thinking as I was reading it, you can make a film about all these different families, you know, the, the hero's journey, which is what all mm. films will have within it. It kind of plays out in every one of those experiences. It's, it's, it's a story of life, you know, the ups, the downs, how we get over things. It's, it's really quite incredible, isn't it? And then if I think about relationships, so that's your pitch, relationships are front and center of what it means to live a happy, healthy, and long life. And of course, we started off this conversation talking about those two major predictors that you write about in your book, the frequency and the quality of our contact with other people. So if we think about relationships, well, the way my brain sees it is, well, okay, there's relationships. How can we break that down? There's a relationship with myself. You just mentioned the meditation cushion where you sit and 
you work on your relationship with yourself. And then we start to expand it out. There's a relationship maybe with a romantic partner, if we have one. If we don't, of course, we don't have that. Relationship with our family, relationship with our friends, relationship with our work colleagues. The list goes on and on. Relationship with the baristas and the coffee shops, right? So there's all these kind of circles that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So if we're to take you guys at face value and say, okay, relationships are important, which are the most important? There, there's, there's no which about it. There's no most all- important about it. They're all important. What we do believe is that everybody needs one or two, what we call securely attached relationships. Um, that at, at one point in our study, um, we asked our participants, who could you call in the middle of the night if you were sick or scared? And most people could list several people, but some people couldn't list anyone. And a few of those people were married and they couldn't list anyone. What we believe is that everybody, whether you're shy or extroverted, everybody needs at least one or two of what we call securely attached relationships where you feel like someone will be there for me if I'm really in trouble. I mean, that's a great question, isn't it? Are you up to speed with the latest research? And I mean, I don't know, maybe not in the UK, but in the US, where are we up to with loneliness at the moment? Yeah, so loneliness, significant problem in all Western countries and also non-Western countries as well. So, you know, the rates are in the U.S. somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of adults talk about being lonely. And, And what that means, it's the opposite of what Bob is describing. It's not having a sense that someone has your back or knows who you are. Um, but people just don't care whether you exist or not. So those are incredible rates. If you think about 20 to 40% of the adult population says that there's no one that really knows who they are and can they could depend on. So this is a serious problem. The health risk, as we talked about before, is similar to the risks that we associate with smoking and obesity. So this is why there's a Ministry of Loneliness in the UK. Yeah, this is yeah. why our Surgeon General, our top health person, talks a lot about loneliness. It's a recognition of the importance of relationships to our health as we get more and more tech savvy, we can be overly reductionist. It's almost as if, if we can measure it, great. If we can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And of course, you know, what's that phrase? You know, not everything that we measure matters Mm -hmm. and not everything that matters can be measured, Mm -hmm. right? There's no relationship blood test, Right. right? Where the doctor pulls your blood and goes, yeah, yeah, your relationships are great. You know, we can do that with blood sugar. We can do that with hemoglobin to tell you if you're anemic, but we can't do that with relationships. And you mentioned the West and and where I'm getting to here is if you went to an Eastern country, or I reckon even in the West, if you went and spoke to people and asked them how important are relationships, I think everyone would say, yeah, they're really important. Yet when we think about it through the lens of health, I don't think many of us think about it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I mean, why do you think that is? Well, one of the problems is that relationships can't be measured in the same way. I mean, we can say, okay, I'm, I'm eating right. I'm eating this many calories a day. I'm exercising this many minutes. I'm doing these health behaviors, right? But what is a relationship and, and how do you nurture relationships? It's much more amorphous. It's messier. It's more complicated. And so to say invest in this is so much less specific and and easily grasped than, you know, do 10,000 steps a day, Yeah, right? And that's part of the problem. It's very difficult to, to get our heads around this, even though all of us know in our guts, hey, this is really important. Yeah, it's such a great point. Let's talk about friendship, because I think friendship really speaks to this. And there's a whole section in the book on friendship. It's pretty common, certainly in this country, that men seem to prioritize their friendships less than women. Now, look, this is a gross generalization. I appreciate that's not the same in every case. But the loneliest group in this country at the moment, according to the latest research I've read, are men between the age of 35 and 50. There's a very high suicide rate Mm -hmm. in men. And what's pretty common, and and I guess I can probably hold my hand up and say, I've been a little bit guilty of this in my own life. As adulthood kicks in and you have responsibilities and mortgages and jobs or whatever, often 
we, we may have really good friends. I'm lucky to have really good friends, but sometimes you don't end up seeing them for quite a long time. Yeah. And there's nothing like those nourishing experiences with your friends. So first of all, let's talk about friendship. It's quite a unique I mean, it is very unique, isn't it? Because we choose our friends. We don't choose our family, but we choose our friends. So can you talk a little bit about friendship and why it's so important? Well, I think I think partly because of this idea that we choose our friends, that friendships are particularly prone to to distancing, that we we, we sort of let our friendships wither. We we figure that they're going to work and we don't have to sort of lean in and, and put energy into them. So we talk in the book about this idea about social fitness and social fitness applies to all of your relationships, but we need to kind of exercise those relationship muscles to really connect with people, to, to spend time, to allot time that we can, you know, be together with the people that are important to us. And friends are particularly vulnerable, I think, because of this idea that they're, they're folks that we choose. And oftentimes we make friends through the activities that we're doing in life. So they might be schoolmates from university that uh, we're no longer doing the same activities. So we have to figure out ways to keep those relationships going. Whereas relatives, I think we often feel that connection around holiday times or family events that there's, there are ways in which they keep going. But I think the, the kind of bigger issue here is that there's so many distractions today for our time that all of us spend a lot of time on screens these days, sometimes doing work, sometimes being distracted, could be by social media or traditional media. But we, we have to really kind of harvest our time for the things that are most important for us. And it's harder and harder to do that with these devices that pull us away from yeah. those things that are critical for us. Um Doing this research, I've realized that I have to start taking my own medicine. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I realized that particularly once my kids were grown and out of the house and they weren't like pulling me away and saying, dad, do this or drive me here, that I could just work all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I've had to do is be much more intentional about scheduling walks with people, uh, scheduling dinners out. Uh, Mark and I have a call every Friday noon. And we talk, yes, we talk about our writing and our research, but we also just talk about our lives. And I find that if I'm not active, really active every week in doing things with people who I want to keep current with, it'll, it'll wither away. And so I'm doing more of that now than I ever did when I was younger. And, yeah. and there are definitely points during the life, one time as middle age, when, you know, we get pulled away from those connections more, that we have responsibilities, like family responsibilities, our kids are also calling for our attention and they need us. Um, late life is another moment when folks are in retirement and changing, you know, their lives in important ways. So any transition is a point where friendships that have been important are threatened in some ways. We really need to lean in and take care of them. Yeah. There's a wonderful story in the book, I can't remember his name now, of someone who actually didn't have that many friends through mm. their adult life, but in retirement, yeah, incredible. suddenly became like a, a friendship pro. Yeah, Andrew can you, can you, yeah. Who yeah, was yeah. it, sorry? Andrew Deering, I think yeah. it was, right? Yeah. yeah. It was just wonderful yeah. to read that. And, it, and I, yeah. think, I think it gives people hope. I think that story, because if one is feeling, oh, man, I'm, I'm really busy with my work, for example, that I don't have time, yeah. this can change. Yeah. The other thing is that he was an example of somebody who said, eh, I'm just not very good at relationships. I'm never going to have good friends. And he didn't have much of a marriage. And one of the chapters in the book is titled, It's Never Too Late, yeah. because there are these real life stories of people who were sure it was never going to happen for them, good relationships. Mm -hmm. And then when they didn't expect it, they found good relationships. And so we want to kind of bring this message that, that from these real life histories, we have good evidence that there are surprises in store for people. I want us to go about that practical exercise in just a moment in the friendship chapter, which I think is in chapter four and then the section on social fitness. It's a really beautiful exercise. Before we get to that, though, just a comment. You know, you said, um, Bob, that you could just work if left to your own devices. And I know how much culture influences what we perceive to be normal or what we end up doing with our time. You know, the, our environment has a huge influence on us. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'm writing about at the moment for my, for my next book is this idea of heroes. And, you know, we, we, we kind of worship the wrong heroes, I think, in modern culture. And, you know, we may look at someone 
successful online, let's say, and go, wow, look at their life. But we're just seeing one narrow aspect of their life. They may be doing that at the cost of all their relationships, but we don't see that. We go, wow, they're successful. But are they successful or have they, have they traded in the most important things in their life for a bit of work success? I think this is a massive, massive problem. And that's why I think your book and your, your, your research is really, really important. So yeah, what you're saying reminds me of, of something one of my teachers said, which is we're always comparing our insides to other people's outsides. These curated lives, right? Yeah. These, these supposed heroes, influencers, whoever they might be, right? Who, who show us these lives that look like they've got it all figured out. And maybe they're working all the time. Maybe they've won the Nobel Prize. But, but what we don't know is what it's like to live that experience. And what we do know is that our own lives are messy and complicated and have challenges and ups and downs. And so I think part of the difficulty is trying to understand the reality that we know from following thousands of people, that there is no perfect life yeah. and that it's always a set of trade-offs. I think it goes back to this idea about how hard it is to quantify our connections to others, the quality of them, right? So it's easy to count the number of likes that I have on a post. It's very hard to, to quantify the quality of my connection with people that are important to me. And I think we all get distracted by that. So, you know, I remember days of my life where, you know, I didn't feel it was a particularly a productive day, but I'd say, okay, I spent eight hours or 10 hours today working, right? There's a way that we quantify our lives mm -hmm. that helps us kind of justify or make sense meaning of our lives that I think um, we, we can run down the wrong path sometimes in that way. Yeah, money is the same thing, easy to quantify, right? Yeah. I've always been incredibly fascinated by cultures which have this kind of prioritization of relationships mm -hmm. and frankly switch off built in mm -hmm. you know the jewish sabbath for example i i just love that as a concept and i for many months years i keep chatting to my wife about look we're not jewish but i think the sabbath is awesome a great thing yeah and yeah, i think yeah, we yeah. should build our own version of that because if we don't it's too easy to let the modern world infiltrate your weekends. Yeah. And I just, I just love that. No, it's basically a mechanism for me. And again, please correct me if I, I've misinterpreted this. It's a mechanism where I would say, no, switching off, focusing on those around us is important. So we're going to put it in the diary. Nothing yeah. gets in the way of that. I think that's right. And I think, you know, it's incredible. You, you, you hear these stories about young people today doing this, teenagers doing this. They, they get together with friends, they turn off their phones, that they're intentionally leaning into their connections and trying to move those distractions away, right? So they're, they're becoming anti-technology in a certain way. The trick, of course, is to figure out ways to use the technology in ways that are going to help us. But I think there are lots of movements out there and the Sabbath is a wonderful example, but there are lots of other yeah. examples. Yeah. I do retreats every, yeah. every couple months. I do a Zen retreat where for two or three days, I'm with a group of people and we sit silently and we walk and we eat very mindfully. It's really spending time just doing a deep dive into the simplest aspects of being alive. And of course, no phones, no real connections with the outside world. And we come away refreshed and sort of amazed at what it's like when you slow down and mm. simplify everything. He's different. I mean, I've seen it. I, Bob is different after a retreat. Um, this is really interesting. So are these people you know? Some of them I know, some of them I don't know. Okay, so this is really interesting. So we've been talking about friendship and clearly those are people we know and we've chosen. But what you're kind of sharing here is how the act of pausing, stepping outside of your life and doing something together in community, even if you don't know them, is incredibly powerful. Yes, yes. It's a, uh, one of the things we say is it's very much alone and together. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're doing. You are sitting alone, walking alone, and you're very much with other people. Um, what's and, a, what's an, uh, some more examples of equivalent things 
that people can think about in their own life? Like what's, what's the principle mm. there that people can take yeah. away? I mean, that's what I think is, is important because sometimes people say, oh, I should meditate, but it's not for me. Well, meditation isn't for everybody. That really, I think what we hope everyone can find is something where they're in what we might think of as a state of flow, where they're in a situation where they are completely absorbed and where time just passes by effortlessly, right? That could be playing music. That could be walking in the woods. That could be gardening. Could be so many things. But I think for each of us, there there may be a, an activity that allows us to be fully absorbed. And it's very nourishing and energizing to be in that kind of state. Even if you're doing it by yourself. Even if you're doing it by yourself. So how does that then fit with the importance of relationships? Well, in Zen practice, what happens is I watch my incredibly messy mind and complicated body and realize, oh my God, everybody has this mind and body, this kind of mind and body, right? And then what happens is a kind of natural arising of compassion for other people. Mm. It's not something I have to cultivate. It just happens. And then what I realize is that my connections with other people are different as a result of what I come to see and accept in myself as I yeah. sit on a cushion. And and part of it, I'm guessing you would say, I think part of it is this ability to be present as well, that you cultivate an ability to focus on something. In meditation, it might be on your breath or on your experience in some way. And we can bring that to relationships. So I can really focus in on what I think you might be experiencing, really be interested in yeah. hearing what you're saying. And it's so rare in this modern world that we give people that kind of attention. And I, I think that's something you cultivate as well. Through, oh, yeah. Yeah. If that conversation resonated with you, here is another incredibly powerful one that I really think you're going to enjoy. As we sit down every day to make a decision about what we eat or we go to the store to buy some food, we need to realize whatever we put into our body is either going to take our health down or build our health back up. 